What he pointed out is that most of the people we're recognizing are builders and uh, crafts, craftsmen. Um, they're probably working. So we, we, um, we will, oh, there he is, John Hand. <laughs> All right, John Hand. You may not recognize him, he's usually Uncle Sam. <laughs> Uh, the next proclamation actually goes um, uh, very well with the recognition of uh, the individuals who were involved in the polar bear plunge. Um, we have a, a very distinguished resident uh, here in Brigantine who has had a long uh, career um, as a very popular radio host um, here in South Jersey. Um, I say it goes in hand in hand with the polar bear plunge recognition because Don Williams on his radio show promotes all the charitable events uh, that take place not only in Brigantine but throughout our region. And uh, he's the individual who is on the air talking about the polar bear plunge, encouraging uh, people to come to those events. Um, many of the events at the Brigantine Elks, and I could go on and on about uh, the charitable causes that he is involved in, um, including uh, the Marine Corps League and, and a number of other charities that he has dedicated his time to. Um, he has had a very distinguished career in broadcasting, but uh, last week, um, the apex of his career um, was certainly, I think, uh, has occurred in that he has been recognized um, as a uh, New Jersey, and inducted into the New Jersey Hall of Fame, New Jersey Broadcasters Hall of Fame, which is a tremendous honor um, in his profession. And uh, Don is a, um, a longtime resident of Brigantine and someone, as I said, who was involved in organizations here in Brigantine and has continues to promote uh, charitable events and uh, the city of Brigantine. So I have a proclamation for Don. I'd like to invite Don up and Uh, this proclamation reads, whereas Don Williams, an esteemed citizen of the city of Brigantine, was recently inducted into the New Jersey Broadcasters Hall of Fame during the 67th annual New Jersey Broadcasting Association Conference and Gala, and whereas Don has an exemplary history of leadership having hosted the Don Williams Show on WOND News Talk 1400 since 1985, and has earned the respect and admiration of everyone in his field, now, therefore, the City Council of the City of Brigantine does hereby congratulate Don Williams and urge our fellow citizens to join with me in expressing the pride and gratitude of an appreciative community. Hall of Fame broadcaster, Brigantine resident, Don Williams. Congratulations. I'll say a few words just for you. I have a whole speech. Joni, don't break out in a sweat. <laughs> I see all the Democrats have signed this, too. That makes me very, very happy. Thank you, gentlemen. I know it might, you might have ladies. thought of that. I appreciate it very much. I think they're all on here, aren't they, Andy? Yes. Because yes. yes. they did up, uh, I had the pleasure, too, Chris Brown, our assemblyman, managed to have the New Jersey Assembly also give me a proclamation and award and uh, had the speaker on, and, you know, it's, Heavily Democrat, they did it too, so don't, don't be too embarrassed about signing <laughs> this thing. I just want to say thank you, and following the people that were here, I really feel humble. They're the ones that really do a lot of work, body and soul, into it. And it proves, although we do have our differences on this island, that's been brought forth in the last year or so more than ever, but when tragedy strikes, this island comes together. Sandy proved that. And uh, thanks to our leadership of everybody there and in public service, our first responders, I am so proud to live here since 1974. Never been more prouder. This is a great island. It had state recognition, too, for the service that these people did. Uh, the aftermath of Sandy and is still going on. Thank you, and God bless everybody. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, Don, once again, congratulations, and uh, 
Don did receive a bipartisan, unanimous uh, um, support here at Brigantine City Council as well as uh, New Jersey State Assembly. So, Don, thank you. And um, I think we'll probably hold on the Lighthouse recognition unless there's someone here from that group um, until our next meeting, which uh, next evening meeting when all these uh, gentlemen and the ladies who are working um, probably can make it. Uh, but we do want to recognize the, the great job they did, the volunteers restoring our lighthouse, um, which is a beautiful symbol coming into the island right now. So uh, we're going to move on with the, uh, the agenda. And um, if anyone, uh, anyone would like to leave, we, we'll take a uh, five-minute recess. I understand some people may not want to stay for the entire agenda. So we'll take a five-minute recess and then reconvene the meeting. Thank you.
All in favor? Aye. Aye. Get that thing a little harder. Okay, we're going to continue the meeting. Okay, the next order of business is the uh, public comment. And this public comment session is for agenda items only, so if there is something on the agenda you, that you would like to comment on specifically, um, please uh, feel free to step forward, use the microphone, state your name and address for the record, and uh, please keep in mind that we have a uh, five minute um, limit on comments, and, and we'll let you know when you're getting close to that five minute limit. Okay, anyone who would like to speak on agenda items only? Okay, see, uh, no public participation on the agenda items. We're going to go into our agenda. And um, we have uh, the um, resolutions to approve uh, various liquor licenses um, throughout the city of Brigantine. Um, we're going to begin with resolution 2014-108, uh, which is the liquor license, re license renewal for the Brigantine Yacht Club. Um, Phil, excuse me. If there's no objections, could we just move forward and do it as a single? I don't, um, I don't know if we can do that. We have to. Yeah. I asked that yesterday. <laughs> the the uh, well, I, uh, can you bundle Council Member Cardi wanted to know if you could bundle. Uh, assuming that there is no specific discussion right. as to any of them, assuming there are, there are not going to be any dissenting votes. If Council's uh, treating this singularly, yes, you can do that. You can move them as a group, Will Effect there, effectively as a consent agenda. Right. Will there be any, um, does anybody have to abstain on any of these, or are we okay? No. All right, so um, we have a um, motion to uh, consolidate resolutions 2014-110 through um, 2008. 2008. I'm sorry, 108 through 16. 16. The motion second, please. So moved. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Hope not. Okay. See none. Could we have roll call, please? Simpson. Yes. McClay. Yes. Bacardi. Yes. Delufri. Yes. Palilla. Yes. Mayor Gunther. Yes. Motion carries. We move to uh, resolution 2014-117, assertion of a special item of revenue in the budget for the clean communities. Do you have a motion and a second, please? So move. Second. Okay, any discussion? Seeing none, can we have roll call, please? Simpson? Yes. McClay? Yes. Bacardi? Yes. DeLucre? Yes. Palilla? Yes. Mayor Gunther? Yes. Motion carried. Resolution 2014-118, the consent for the county roadway solicitation for the Brigantine PBA, um, which would be on August 3rd, 8 a.m. to 5 um, at uh, Route 87 Harbor Beach Boulevard. Motion to second, please. So moved. Second. Any discussion? See none, can we have roll call, please? Simpson? Yes. McClay? Yes. Bacardi? Yes. DeLucre? Yes. Palilla? Yes. Mayor Gunther? Yes. Motion carried. <clears throat> uh, resolution 2014-119, uh, consent for the county roadway solicitation for the Brigantine um, International Association of Firefighters. Um, and this would be on August 31st, 2014. This is the fill to boot from 8 o'clock to 5 o'clock. And um, it's uh, f right in front of the firehouse on 14th Street. Motion second, please. So second. second. Any discussion? <coughs> Seeing none, can we have roll call? Simpson? Yes. McClay? Yes. Bacardi? Yes. DeLucre? Yes. Palilla? Yes. Mayor Gunther? Yes. Motion carried. Okay. A resolution 2014-120 is an award of contract for furnishing of water well and pump service repair. And uh, the contract um, is awarded to A.C. Schultes uh, based um, on their bid. Um, of uh, $53,450 for, 250, 200, for 2014 and $53,100 for 200 or for 2015. Have a motion, a second, please. So moved. So moved. Any discussion? Um, yeah, just one question. I, I'm not sure if John would have this information. Uh, looks like there was quite a spread between the first and the uh, second and third bidders. Do we know why that was? 
I don't know why it was. It was reviewed at length, and uh, they're the lowest responses, responsible bidder. And, that's what, and we've used AC Schultes in the past. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Any further discussion? Seeing none, could we have roll call? Simpson? Yes. McClay? Yes. McCarty? Yes. DeLucre? Yes. Fluilla? Yes. Mayor Gunther? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, we move to our consent agenda. Um, we have the American Legion annual barbecue request, the Bramble Drive block party request, the Francis Harrison birthday block party request, and the Chamber of Commerce bonfire request, Brigantine Elks raffle license, uh, licenses 705 and 706. We have a motion and second, please. So move. Second. We have roll call. Simpson? Yes. McClay? Yes. McCarty? Yes. DeLucre? Yes. Palilla? Yes. Chair Gunther? <clears throat> yes. Motion carries. Okay, we move to the uh, manager council discussion, and um, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Jim Rotella, um, who is um, our grant consultant for the city of Brigantine. I have to say, uh, one of the most successful grant consultants, I think, in the state of New Jersey. And if you saw the paper this week, you saw that uh, we received um, a $340,000 um, planning grant through uh, CDBG uh, that Jim was successful in securing uh, for post-Sandy planning activities. And um, with that, uh, Jim has worked with us for a number of years. And uh, uh, every year, he's been very successful in, in making sure that we are in line for those grants that are available. Um, at all different levels of government. So, Jim, I know you want to talk today about NJEIT, so I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Good morning, Mayor, Council. Um, this is really an update on the New Jersey Environmental Infrastructure Trust applications that Council authorized uh, last December. Uh, in March, uh, after uh, much engineering work was completed, uh, full applications were made to the Trust for eight projects. And just uh, to refresh everyone's memory, I'll just go through the projects, uh, the names of the projects. The first was the replacement of water well number number nine. Excuse me, Jim. Sorry. The first, I'm sorry. The first was the replacement of uh, water well number nine in the south, south end of the community. The second was golf course neighborhood uh, stormwater improvements. The third were pump stations at Hackney Place, 34th Street South, and Jenkins Parkway. Fourth was the boat ramp area flood control improvements. The fifth was the south end flood control improvements. Sixth was emergency generators for many of the stormwater and water uh, and sewer facilities in the community. The next was uh, flood control to elevate the 12th Street, uh, 12th Street North and East Evans Boulevard. And uh, there was also an application for a bulkhead replacement at various street ends. Those applications are now being reviewed uh, by the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. I spoke with them yesterday. Um, they actually have staffed up because they received a no obviously a number of applications from the coastal communities. Um, they hope to have feedback to us very, very shortly. None of these projects to date are approved by DEP, which is really the first step. Uh, once the projects are approved by DEP, then uh, the governing body will have a decision to make. You can do one of two things. The financing uh, for all these projects is now um, embodied in legislation that's before the state legislature. And that financing would be available in May of next year. So one option is to wait until the final financing is available in May of 2015. The second option is to take advantage of interim financing that the trust provides for. Um, and they feel this is especially important you know, because of uh, a lot of these projects are uh, Superstorm Sandy related and communities want to move forward. The interim financing, uh, once the projects are approved by DEP, uh, the council would uh, pass an ordinance to request interim financing. And uh, interim financing can, would allow projects to start construction this fall. 
Um, the interim financing is uh, less than 1%, usually much less than 1% because it's uh, AAA, a credit, it's just a short-term note uh, that's provided through by the trust. And then that is really just rolled into your overall financing of the project. Just to, uh, uh, again, review this program, the program is uh, based on an 18% grant um, and uh, a zero interest loan and 25% of the project is a market rate loan. So it's a very attractive financing for infrastructure. Um, that's really the extent of my update. Uh, I expect that probably in the next couple weeks, possibly before your next council meeting, we'll get feedback on individual projects as far as whether they're approved or not or whether they need some additional information. And as we get that, we'll keep you advised uh, through Jennifer and um, you'll be able to make decisions at the <coughs> next council meeting or, or a future council meeting as to whether you want to pursue interim financing. Jim, this eight, eight billion that is coming from Washington in the form of block grants to the states, is that gonna influence how much w or increase the grants that we'll be able to get instead of looking for financing? At, at this point, it will not. I mean, I, all what uh, the legislation calls for is an 18% grant. So while we have lobbied that there be more funding for grants, um, that, hasn't, that hasn't come to fruition at this point. Jim, do we have, um, through the engineer's office, I know we've done some preliminary work on some of these. Um, perhaps we can go back and look at the cost of each project and then try and figure out priorities where we can move forward. And, you know, a couple of things jump out that mm -hmm. probably have to be done right away um, and might do the most in terms of mitigating flooding in a, in a particular area. So if we could kind of get that information, if you would wouldn't sure. mind working with Ed Stinson to, and putting that together, and then we can come back at, at the next meeting, perhaps, or uh, one after that, and then look and see what we can do right away. Also, what can be done quickly? And, you know, a couple of things that, that jump out at the, um, that, that have been continually a problem, even on moderate flooding, uh, an area like the boat, the boat ramp. Mm -hmm. That may be something that we can get done quickly and, and would solve a lot of problems um, in that area as fast as possible and not be that costly going forward. Okay, be happy to provide that summary and, and also keep you up to, up to uh, date on the uh, DEP's review. Great, and Jim, Jim I have a question Jim. just yes. to clarify the 1%, um, the, uh, the interim financing in the event that we do wanna start a project prior to 15 when, when the financing's available, the interim financing of less than 1% would be for that time period before the actual financing is uh, is uh, ready. Yes. Right. So, so it'd be less than a year. So 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 obviously it would be very inexpensive for us to do that if we had a project that uh, we needed to move forward quickly. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And the other good thing, and, and it's a really credit to you, uh, your leadership. All these projects have been designed. Right. There's plans and specs. So as soon as DEP approves them. This doesn't have to be a drawn out process. It can move very quickly. And one other question, Jim. Once that financing is uh, in place uh, in, in 2015, is there a limit or time limit when we have to uh, start any of the projects that have been approved? I'm sure there is. I don't know specifically, but I'll, I'll get that answer for you. Okay. Uh, it's usually two years, but I don't want to say that. Uh, let, me, let me check on it first. All right. Thank you. Jim, do you know on the projects you just mentioned, were all the engineering services complete on all of these projects? Yes. Okay. So yes. it's up to us to decide how we're going to prioritize moving forward. Yes. And well, I agree, the areas that are hit worse with flooding and have had repetitive flooding, those are the areas we should definitely focus on. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, Jim, thank you for coming over on a Saturday morning. Appreciate the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, we have, uh, I know we've received uh, some information, um, a uh, petition uh, to um, 
make the 200 block of 13th Street one way, and then we received some corresponding, uh, some correspondence uh, um, both for and against uh, making 13th Street one way. So uh, that is on for a discussion item. Um, I'll just begin by saying that I think we need to, to do a lot more analysis before uh, anything is, is done in that area. Um, I do appreciate the, the individuals who have uh, brought the petition forward and also those who have sent um, conflicting views of whether it needs to be one way or not. Um, the other point I think we need to bear in mind is that um, it really is a problem um, in terms of traffic in that area uh, during the summer months, particularly on the weekends, but um, for the majority of the year, it, it is not um, a, a huge issue in terms of traffic. But um, with that said, um, <coughs> hear from different council members how they feel about it, and uh, we'll, then we'll hear from the public, uh, I'm sure, during the public portion. But I don't anticipate that um, any action will be taken today on that issue as um, a lot more study needs to be done. Um, both through the engineer's office and uh, talking to the police and, and getting feedback um, about uh, what the traffic pattern is and, and if, in fact, um, there are any safety issues that have been identified or, or uh, data out there that shows that we need to do uh, something moving forward. I think the biggest uh, question that I have is the issue of safety. Uh, you know, can fire trucks get down that way quick? Can an ambulance get down? Is that going to impede any? any flow but and you know I don't know if there's even any traffic studies or information available on the volume but is that going to negatively affect the flow of traffic on the on the uh, on the avenue I uh, just want to say this matter came to my attention last summer and I spoke to the resident who brought it to my attention about the lack of parking in the summer the K turns in the street congestion uh, cars getting bumped so we've been discussing this back and forth for about a year now and um, there has been a petition that circulated um, I wish that all residents were um, able to sign this uh, I understand some people were excluded from signing it or unavailable and weren't able to sign it and then some people have already requested that their name be removed I just want to bring everyone up to speed and after the last meeting I had with the city manager and acting chief and this particular resident, I believe that having all cars entering 13th Street South from West Brigantine Avenue could be a traffic and a safety issue. You have that center lane where people turn in 13th Street South 200 block. You have people that use that same lane going the other direction, the center lane on West Brigantine Avenue entering in the parking lot on 13th Street South. You're going to have two cars from each direction coming to that center lane to make opposite turns. It seems like that could turn into um, a little bit of a problem, everyone entering the 200 block from West Brigantine Avenue. Um, it could create more traffic. Now you have everyone coming down one way as opposed to traffic flowing from two directions. So at this time, I think um, this is something that we shouldn't, at the current time, move forward with. Um, I have a question. Uh, Tim, do you know offhand, I forgot whether there's parking on both sides or just one side of that street? Both sides. Is it both sides? Because if it's an issue of congestion and the flow of traffic, possibly considering just putting traffic uh, parking on one side, because that's a pretty narrow street. I would think a fire truck would have a really hard time getting down there with, uh, to move quickly with parking on both sides of that street. That might be an alternative. To One of the problems is there, there isn't enough parking, um, mm, mostly yeah. off-street parking in those areas because some, you have a mix of lots. Some right. lots are 40 feet wide, some are um, 60, so it gives the, uh, the homeowner has some challenges there too, whether there is off-street parking. So it's. Mm. It, it is, and, and I understand what you're saying, Joe, but it is, a, um, from the resident standpoint, I'm not sure exactly where they would park unless they were all able to get something off street. Um, well, I, I reached out to Doug Keith, uh, the owner of the building on the corner of 13th Street and Brigantine Avenue, 
Uh, he has beachcomber coins and collectibles, and also John Johnson that has the bike, bike shop. Um, they weren't really concerned. You know, they basically said the, basically the same thing. Um, you know, it would be nice if it was one way, but it's, it's no big deal for them either way on that. Um, but I would like to have an opinion from uh, uh, Lieutenant Reed over here and, and of course from public after we get done with this discussion. Um, actually, Lieutenant Reed was here for the liquor licenses only. It was the <laughs> acting chief, um, Ray Cox. He was the one that assessed 13th Street and Ed, the city engineer also assessed it. They don't, you know, have a problem with it being two ways, and they don't have a problem with it being one way, as long as it's one way east to west. Because going right. from west to east, um, there's issues with that being a county road, Brigantine yeah, Avenue. I, I certainly wouldn't want them to go out and onto Brigantine Avenue. I'd mm -hmm. rather than go mm -hmm. down to Beach Avenue, if, if that was the decision. But you know, again, I'd like to talk, listen to. The Could I get um, Lieutenant Reed? Can I ask you a question? West Brigantine Avenue, 13th Street South, the center lane, the turn lane. If you have people heading north, people heading south on that center lane, both making a turn, what is that going to create at that intersection? If you have people turning into the 200 block from the center lane, and then you have people going south turning Well, they do that east. now, because yeah. they're doing it now. No, so but with the lanes. additional traffic. Because that's going to be the only way to enter the 200 block. Could that become a problem? Uh, it, it could. I think it could become a problem. Um, we, no. we, the police department, have to do more of the study and uh, traffic patterns. We can see how much traffic is going. Do you hear Tim, if you uh, use the, 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 the mic. The police department is going to have to do uh, more, more study. Okay. Um, see how much traffic actually is flowing through there. The other, um, probably the most significant issue I see in that area is um, people coming out of uh, the um, 300 block, I guess, of 13th Street and making a left-hand turn. Um, that, that is, a, especially during the summer months, is a much more, mm -hmm. I think, dangerous move mm -hmm. than, than anything else in that area where you well, have well, uh, people coming out of the, coming parking out of the, the municipal way. parking mm -hmm. area and, you know, that there's a lot of flow through there because uh, the liquor store and um, you know the businesses people coming in and out so you know that may be something if we undertake a um, some review of that area that that we look at that specifically as well so that um, we can make a recommendation I know that's turning on to a county road so it mul might uh, create some issues where we'd have to coordinate through the county and through DOT but that is a, I feel a very dangerous turn um, and you see people waiting there for a long time to, to try and if you're waiting a long time to make a turn you probably uh, might want to consider going the other way you know going around the block the um, you know th that and along with that is that uh, and I know it's an enforcement issue with the police department you're constantly doing this but people parking too close uh, to the curb so they're obstructing the view of people trying to pull out and that I know you constantly are out there you know, trying to get people to uh, come into compliance, and um, it's going to, especially during the summer, it's, it's not an easy um, thing to do because people want to jump out real quick and run in and get something, but uh, they are obstructing the view of other people trying to pull out in those areas. Are, are there any um, implications for property values with a one-way street? Does it diminish property values at all? I, I wouldn't think so. Are th any other uh, council comments on the one-way street? If not, we can open it up to the public for public comment. And any, perhaps anyone who wants to talk on that issue could talk first, and then we could move into other public comment. Are we going to talk I'd about the fish finder? I think it was oh. crossed out, I think. It well, it's still yeah. on here. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was yeah, crossed out. Yeah, so I just have one thing to add on this. Jennifer, you want to? Are we taking the fish finder request off? That's off. Yes, that, okay. that's all for okay. the time being. Um, we do have one other agenda item that we discussed in executive session. Okay. Um, one I think thing Rick wants to have it on the 13th On the 13th. Um, yeah, I just want to make it clear, Phil, I agreed with you that it's not something we're going to be able to make a decision on today, and we do need to look at the, the entire universe of impacts. I mean, mm -hmm. that section of street is not 
a standalone. Everything that happens in the traffic flow in and around those couple blocks is going to impact it. And I think we'll hear from the, the immediately affected stakeholders, or at least some of them today. By my count, I think you have maybe 20 residences on the street, on that block. Please. You have a couple business people. Uh, you know, anecdotally, we all have our opinions, I guess, about what, what works and doesn't work and what might happen. But you know, if we're going to consider making a change or the wisdom of doing it, we do need to look at the, the whole picture. Part of it, big part of it, is going to be, I think, the residents' opinions. If we could get all of the opinions, or at least all the opinions of people who want to offer an opinion, that would be good. But in-house, as Lieutenant Reed says, you know, we have to we have to look at what could happen in different scenarios before we uh, get to the point where we can make any decision. Okay, and uh, Fred, was there one other item? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, we should probably just do the summary of what took place in the executive session, and the executive session discussions may result in one action item that council wishes to consider. Okay. So if that is the case, uh, I would advise that in executive session, city council discussed uh, matters of personnel, specifically receiving a report from the city manager in regard to the status uh, of the positions of chief of police and chief of fire. Uh, additional information will be made available to the public in that matter upon conclusion of certain negotiations uh, which are anticipated to be concluded within the next uh, 30 to 45 days. Uh, additionally, in executive session, council discussed one matter of litigation and received a report uh, from my office in regard to Guthrie Glass versus Ernest Brock and Sons, the city of Brigantine and others. Uh, that discussion focused on a proposed partial settlement of that matter. The proposed partial settlement would result in the release of retainage to Ernest Brock and Sons in the amount of $96,441.62. I note that that is not new money, that that is uh, money contained in the original contract and is retainage being held by the city. Should City Council agree with that partial uh, settlement proposal, a motion would be in order to uh, settle with Ernest Brock and Sons uh, in exchange for the release of retainage in the amount that I had just cited. And this is on the uh, community center project? That's correct, sir. Okay, do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, any further discussion? See none, could we vote on the uh, release of retainage to uh, Ernest Brock and Son? Simpson? Yes. McClay? Yes. Cardi? Yes. Delucre? Yes. Palilla? Yes. Mayor Gunther? Yes. Motion carried. Okay. Um, at this time, I'll open the meeting for uh, public comment. Anyone who wants to address council, um, please step forward, use the microphone, state your name and address, um, if you would, for the record. And please keep in mind there is a, a five minute limit. Um, we. Uh, offer the, um, the microphone, I think, first to uh, people who want to speak about 13th Street because that's kind of what part of our discussion was um, just a moment ago. So anyone who wants to speak on the 13th Street issue, why don't, why don't we start with that first? Yes. I'm uh, Mike Alex Eve. I live on 13 South. And uh, we're the ones that signed a petition to create a one-way, mainly because the traffic in the summer especially. Uh, the U-turns, the K-turns, people getting hit in their driveways, uh, cars getting hit that are parked in the driveways with nobody in them. Uh, it's, it's rather difficult to get out of that street onto Brigantine Avenue, mainly because you can't see looking down past the, uh, the bagel shop. Most of the time you can't see. So you're halfway out in the street by the time you get there. Uh, the street's also already designated for a left-hand turn, and the existence of both opposing traffics making a left turn into the parking lot and onto 13th is ready there. So that's, that's a, a non-issue, I think. Also, there's no, there's no county, uh, there's no money has to be spent for the county to change the flow of traffic. It's ready there. All they need is two signs at the beginning, do not enter, and two signs at the other end saying one way. So it's very minimal cost. Uh, Ed Stinson, Ray Cox, myself, Jennifer, uh, Lisa, we're all pretty much in agreement. We thought that it would be a, a good idea, especially for a safety issue, trying to get out on Brigantine Avenue, coming past uh, or up to the avenue, making a right, is 
on the weekends almost impossible. So we thought it would be a good way to, to get the traffic to flow one way. So I don't, I don't really see any real stumbling block in approaching the county if that needs to be done and have them approve it. Mike, do you have your preference for which way? Well, yeah, it has to go continue towards West Beach. Right. Uh, if, if it was approved. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, coming on to the avenue would be defeats then, the purpose. Then the county would get involved apparently right. and have a, a big commotion about too much traffic coming on the street. And, right. You know, so going to West Beach for that one block would be the the ultimate answer for all of us that live here full time. And we even we had some part time people sign the petition also. If they were there, they got asked, and if they weren't, you know, they weren't. I brought that to Jennifer on a Friday. Uh, most of the people were not here on, you know, the part-time people till Thursday night or Friday. Great. Thank you, Mike. Anyone else uh, on 13th Street South? Yes. Robert Palula, two drawer, please. Getting the county involved scares the heck out of me because I work at the Lila Circle there on the it's very scary. Uh, but 13th Street South, uh, one of the considerations well, I would give based on, uh, Mayor, what you said, it is very hard making any turns there. Perhaps from Brigantine Avenue to Ocean Avenue, we reverse that one way going the other way. Coming out of there is crazy, especially when we're coming down Brigantine Avenue north to south and you want to turn into the public parking lot right past that corner. It's horrendous. My recommendation would be uh, definitely 13th Street from uh, Brigantine Avenue to Ocean going one way or the other way and reverse the parking lot entrance. Don't have the entrance coming off of Brigantine Avenue, come, have it coming off of 13th Street. You, know, you have no entrance to the parking lot there. That may be one thing to consider. Thank you. And then as far as the other block, uh, whatever works. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else on 13th Street? Okay. Um, could we have, at this time, anyone who wants to speak on any issue? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, you have to use the microphone if you would. And state your name and address for the record, if you would, please. Good morning. Uh, my name is Beth Corso. I live at 5107 Ontario Drive in Brigantine. Been a resident since 2004. Uh, my question, first of all, I'd like to thank you for having Saturday morning session so that I could be here. Um, my question concerns the placement of porta potties. Um, uh, the decision was made to put porta potties on the island a few years ago, and my question is kind of threefold. Uh, first of all, who makes a decision on the placement of the porta potties? Was any a council or any members of council involved in the decision on the placement of the porta potties? And more specifically, my question is, why? Are there three porta potties on the seaside road access to the beach? And I see no porta potties in the A zone. I well, appreciate your answer. We Thank make you. a lot of decisions. I can tell you, um, I've never had to make a decision on the placement <laughs> of a porta potty. Um, so I would assume those decisions are being made th uh, with Public Works and the city manager's office. And it's based, um, I guess, on volume. So, as you know, Seaside Road is the entranceway to uh, the, the four-wheel drive beach. So there are, a lot, there are a lot of people who go through there. They're not the only porta potties out in that area. There's, there are other porta potties that are closer to the beach. There are porta potties in the A zone, too. They're by the parking lots, and they're shielded with screens. Right, but ours are right on, like, there used to be a lovely vista approaching the beach on Seaside Road and ours are right in front of the vista. And there's one down which I can understand by the access. But Seaside Road is actually a very, it's, it's not very populated, that, that particular beach. There's one of the least populated beaches, as I can see walking the beaches. And I can understand the one there for the access to the beach, but I can't understand them right on the edge of the beach, which blocks the, the lovely vista. Where, Beth, where would you want them put? There are three porta potties where we want to put the, them over the years they've the the doors have been flying open there's been trash accumulated around them this year we've added graffiti um to the port two of the porta potties have graffiti all over them i find them unsightly at this point 
Where would you like to locate them at, though? I think they could be more discreet. I don't think they have to be pink and blue. You know, a, a more neutral color might be nice. Uh, they would be more tasteful. And I think the one back by where the, the um, I guess you call them a guard who watches the inflow of the traffic, I think that one is fine. That's a nice place. But actually, I think the best thing would be if, if Brigantine really believes in public facilities, we should have a park-like facility with running water, um, a really nice bathroom facility that would be maintained by the city and with running water, which is the most sanitary way of providing right. public. Well, we, have, we have miles of beach. That's our challenge. So we do have a bathroom facility at Roosevelt um, and at headquarters, you know, in those two areas, the parking lots. And as Councilman McCarty said, there are porta pots in, in the other areas. But it, it is a challenge to try and build facilities in, in areas that are accessible to everyone who's on the beach. But I agree that, uh, and I know some of that has already started, the shielding of the porta pots uh, with lattice and other types of uh, shields to, to get them out of sight. But um, right now they're the most practical way to, to deal with um, people going to the beach and, and using uh, those facilities as, you know, as opposed to trying to, I guess, get in the car and drive somewhere else or... Um, well, why are there three on one roadside? I mean, it doesn't make sense. There's not another one not from from maybe, uh, maybe the, around the, the Seaside Road, which is like your 50th block, all the way up to 36th Street, 38th Street, I think, it, the, the next one is. Sure. And uh, why not, if you believe in them, why not have it within walking distance for everyone? Then put one on every other block, you know, 20th, 24th. Why are there so many in one place? The reason there are three there is volume. Well, if you look at Seaside Beach, there's not a lot of volume on Seaside Road, the beach itself. It's more down with where the, where the, okay, the three-wheel drives are. They're, 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 we, that is not a populated beach. It's not. I'm, we've well, been there since 2004. That doesn't mean those people sitting on that beach are the ones using the porta pot. Um, it may be the people oh. going out in the four-wheel drives on they're the not way out or the way out. It's a long walk if you've ever been there. It's a long walk. No, they're not walking up there to use the porta potties. There are also porta potties down where the right. four wheel drive. We're are. John, are they at the street end of Seaside Road or are they on the four wheel drive access path? Seaside has one where the uh, inspector is. Yeah. It's a pink one. One there? One there, and then go down toward the beach, almost three quarters of the way down the path. <laughs> there's three. The reason there are three is we coordinate with the company that cleans them and empties them, and under their recommendation, because how full they get, we put another one there. The same yeah. reason down at the Cove and the Jetty, they're populated, and now there, I believe there are three and four, and that comes through the company so that they don't overflow. overflow. Well, there were three before there was any assessment made. The first year they were there, there were three right from the beginning. So there was no assessment at that point. They were mo they, originally, they were up the road curve, and there was two. The partial, the partial enclosure is still there. There was two there. And then there was a recommendation that the people came and asked to have them move down toward the beach part. Well, was every beach block assessed for the usage? Because we oftentimes go to the 20th Street Beach, and there's many more people on the 20th Street Beach than there are on the Seaside Road Beach. I can tell you that. I can't put them on every street end. We put them at city property. They're in 16th Street parking lot. There is a restroom facility there. There is one at 26th Street and 27th Street, which is a municipal parking lot. They're put there, they're put at 34th Street, which is a municipal parking lot. They're at 38th Street, which is a municipal parking lot. Then they're also down on the beach at 38th Street. Yeah, but they're only on the beach, at not at, in the ASM, they're not on the beaches. Correct? Um, 14th Street South, there's two. I don't know how far down the acre zone goes, but um, 9th Street 19th. North, there's uh, Port of pot at the end of the sea wall. But that, that's not, where does Street. the A zone go to? I'm where does the A zone? Sure uh, well, I, I think understand. it's like I guess about 15, 16. I, I think the easiest way to solve this 15, is, 16. John, could you ride out and take a look at where the third port of pot is placed? Yeah. And uh, they, they'll take a look at it. And if you give me a call on Monday, maybe you'll have to get down there or I can meet with you and discuss it. 
Okay, I guess it's, what is your name again? John Boring. Yeah, I'll give him a card. But he's in the middle. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks, man. Yes, Mike. Um, Michael Feely speaking on behalf of Briggs Strong. Um, the uh, Briggs Strong is scheduling their seventh workshop, their Sandy Recovery Workshop, uh, subsequent to um, the excellent strategic, Brigantine Strategic Recovery Report that Jim Rotella uh, presented to council and uh, to others in the community that attended. Uh, we felt that it was important for many of the second homeowners to be aware of this plan as it's going to dramatically impact the real estate values here in Brigantine in a very strong positive manner over the next 20, 25 years. So we've tentatively scheduled the date of August 9th, which is a Saturday. Um, which we will take place at the Brigantine Beach Community Center. We have also invited uh, Congressman Lobiondo to attend to speak uh, about his um, work on mitigating the impact of the famous flood insurance program and uh, how that's going to um, lessen the financial impact on uh, residential homeowners here in Brigantine. Um, we, we feel this is probably one of the strongest reports and is emblematic of the commitment that the, uh, the leadership in Brigantine has put behind developing Brigantine for the future. And we do recommend that any second homeowner and anyone who has any investment in real estate on the island or is considering an investment on the island attend that particular morning because this report is both dramatic and, as I said, will make a very strong financial impact in a positive manner for the island. Uh, we'll confirm this date as we go forward. It's going to be based upon um, Congressman Lobiondo's um, schedule but um, Mr. Rotala has already volunteered his time for that morning. What time is that meeting, Mike? Most probably it'll be at 10, but it's gonna, um, Congressman Lobiondo's scheduler indicated he did have uh, another uh, event that morning, so we're going to try to modify based upon his availability. Great. Hey, Mike, also, I was talking to Charlie yesterday and, and uh, I think Jennifer was with me at the time, and you know I'm just asking the council right now to uh, not vote on it or have it on our discussion next next council meeting to extend the non fees for permits through 2015 because they're just get you guys are just getting your money now, and I think all the contractors are busy and stuff like that. So I think the 2014. Uh, deadline has to be extended for at least another year for we Sandy relief. We concur. Uh, we felt it was premature to make uh, any type of motion at this particular point, but um, you know our REM money is uh, being distributed, you know, right. currently. But they're based upon contractor availability and other financial issues. Many homeowners will not be able to move forward with that until. So 2015. Jennifer, if, if we can't, if we can have a discussion on our regular, I think it's uh, July 16th um, meeting, um, maybe we can discuss that at th that time. And just giving everybody that, you know, a heads up where I, I'm coming from. Well, thank you, Council. I appreciate you, Mike. Thank you, and uh, once again, the work that Briggs Strong has done. Um, it really is a model uh, for the state of New Jersey, and and. Um, it has put us in a much better position, as you know, going forward for a lot of the different grant programs, you know, coupled with the, the work that Jim Rotella has done. Um, and, you know, I say this every time, but um, this group is, and I've gone to meetings at the county, is by and large the, uh, the most effective long-range group in, in, in the county, and I, I would ex expect that it extends beyond that. And uh, it's because of the leadership that you've shown and Reverend Scotland and all the members of your group, so thank you. 
Uh, thank you. I mean, we're just one part of the puzzle, but uh, I think it's uh, the uh, press release that came out of the DEP, or excuse me, DCA, uh, on Thursday afternoon. Um, Constable, Director Constable, uh, made a point of talking about um, um, how Brigantine has pursued um, getting the island ready for the future and, um, and indicated that as an example to the state, other municipalities should follow their example, our example, excuse me. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Yes, John. John Pucci, 100 Sheridan Square. Good morning. Good morning. I want to thank the council for having a Saturday morning meeting. Looks like we have almost a full house here. I think it's an indication that um, your residents are interested in, in local government. And um, I encourage to have more throughout the year, as many as possible. But, but I thank you for the Saturday morning meetings. Also, thank you for the presentations that, that were here this morning. Um, I, I think they're great. I think they set the tone of the meeting and pretty much say what we're all here about, especially when we have ones from the school, the kids come over and, and the debate team and just show what this community I I is about. Um, so I also encourage uh, more the presentations in the beginning meetings, and I thank you for the ones that were done this morning. I have a question about the grant writing. Um, how is that consultant paid? It's just a simple question. I just don't know. I, I'm not a member of the Taxpayer Association. <laughs> um, it seems he, like he's doing a great job and bringing a lot of money into the city. Is that done on a on a percentage basis of the grant? Just how is that consultant um, paid, is my simple question. He's hired as a professional, um, a professional service at the beginning of the year, and he has a capped contract amount that's approved by council. I believe it's 30,000 this year. Right. And the reason we did 30, which was up from last year, is because there was a lot of grants coming in for Sandy resources. To me, that certainly seems to be a great bang for the buck. Th that's great. Which I should mention too, some of these grants actually cover some of his expenses anyway. In fact, uh, the planning grant is kind of a great example of that got a grant that helped us do the planning that he was involved in doing. So, and paid the, his and paid fee for that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. The uh, I go into the public works yards uh, several days a week to empty my recyclables. I see that the fence is going up. Um, I, I I think that's a wonderful thing. Uh, an item that was talked about in prior meetings of council, you see the process go through and it's being installed. I, I think that that's great process and, and that's a very good thing. I wanted to thank who, whoever was involved. Seems like I'm, I'm thanking a lot tonight, but t this morning, but. I find you're, you're much more positive in the morning. Well, <laughs> well I do see a, I, I do see a tie. <laughs> Actually, just let me say, I, I do see somewhat of a tide change with, with, with the, these whole meetings. I, I see them being more positive and um, energetic and, and task oriented. But I wanted to thank whoever changed, who was responsible for changing the meetings time on the, on the website, making that correction. Um, I think that was important to put out the, the correct time. So that was done at a request of mine last meeting and um, I, I think that that was done expeditiously. I understand that the, uh, the smoking uh, ordinance or whatever work that the solicitor is, is working on, that that is a uh, work in progress. Yes. And not necessarily for this meeting. How are we doing with our air pumps at the beach access? Is there an update on that? I don't know if John has done. Have you looked at that, John? Yeah. Um, Ed Stinson and I 
evaluated the cove and the jetty. Um, our opinion is the one that we would like to put at the cove is too close to the residential homes that are there. We can push it down on the beach road a little bit, but it's a low lying area and it floods back there. Um, we looked at one down on Seaside where um, the road turns to go toward the jetty um, at an approximate cost of $2,500. Can you put it up on a pedestal? It will be up on a pedestal. Well, for the flooding area. Correct, it will be, yes. So oh, on the cove area too? The cove area. Not at the cove. We don't recommend putting one at the cove area because it would be too high. As you come off of the cove road, you go down <laughs> and just without surveying it, you're looking at maybe eight feet in the air to keep wow. it. It's a, it's a good drop, and it, we do get flooding back there. Mm -hmm. So our idea was to put signs that if you need air to go to Seaside. Which is not that far away. It's not that yeah. far at all. Was there a time frame on installation? Well, this is the first council hearing about it. Uh, I have a beach committee meeting this week, and I was going to bring it up at the beach committee meeting to uh, bring up our recommendations for the beach committee meeting. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Um, at the last meeting, or the meeting before, um, the golf course topic came up, and uh, the RFP that went out came up, and and I, and it was also mentioned that the more people that know about that, what's going on there, the the better. And and I had requested that the RFP be placed on the website, and it was stated that they are already placed on there. I, I didn't see it on the website. So is it me not seeing it, or has it not been placed on the website? It the RFP. The um, RFP that we already went through, that would be on the website because that's where we advertise part of it, including in the papers. So that should be there. The RFP for um, the long-term leasing, that hasn't been completed yet. So that's what this consultant is doing right now. So you should see the RFP for the consultant to draft the RFP for the long-term leasing on the website. So that hasn't gone out yet? No. For a request yet? Okay. Um, I noticed in the business sections that our crosswalks, a lot of the pads are completely worn out. And I know as I drive through the city, those crosswalks with those big pads going across remind me, in fact, there, that is a pedestrian area and that we're required to stop. Um, and, and some of them are worn out. I know the Brigantine's getting ready for the summer residence. Um, can, can we take a look at those and ensure that the crosswalks are, are fully painted as that reminder um, to stop for pedestrians? John, is that on the list for the county? That's, a, that's county. That's We've been in contact um, with the county because a lot of them are on county roads. John's been very diligent about it, but they haven't gotten back to us with a time frame yet. So there was some specific ones near Shark Park on the Avenue, and um, all yeah, all, all of them. All of them. I was in, I called called the county this week, uh, waiting for a phone call back. I know they just helped me realize that there's a crosswalk there. Um, and lastly, uh, I, I I I had the opportunity last week to attend the play at the community center um, that was put on by the <coughs> Cultural Arts Commission. Um, I think it was a great event, and what a wonderful building that Brigantine Community Center is to sponsor um, e events for the public. Yeah, what a great building. But just to give due to the theater company, the sound and the machinery where it was held was absolutely terrible. It really detracted from the whole performance. And I think hopefully in the future we'll be able to move to the North School Auditorium where it has a really great venue for a theater group, but I think that what the theater group did, the acting and the production and everything were beyond outstanding. The only thing that detracted from it, from, from my point of view, was the machinery noise, and a couple of attempts were made to mitigate that, but it's almost impossible. It's like sitting in a blender trying to listen to something. But you're I, right. It's I think great. the community center is a great asset, asset to Brigantine. <laughs> oh, Thank no you very much. About it.
Thank you, John. Okay, any other public? Yes. Good morning. My name is Paul Van Der Rijn, 311 Dorchester Drive, Egg Harbor Township. Uh, we'd like to uh, ask the council what's the proposal for the ice cream auction on the beach. As you know, last Friday uh, there were no uh, participants, and uh, the primary reason I can tell you is the minimum bid was set at 40000 uh, I had uh, written some of the members of council that I think that number should be reduced um, uh, to, I believe I put 20000 and let the auction process uh, go on, and you, the city will achieve the highest possible you know, bid, you know, with the participants. Uh, we are into the beach season now, and the value of the, the auction is going to be reduced for every day we delay. Um, I mean, is there, has there been a plan? Is there a plan in place? We have not discussed um, moving forward at this point, and I'm sure we will, and solicitor will, will, will give us uh, some advice in terms of how to put it back out again. We have a um, beach committee meeting on Tuesday where we're going to discuss it, but at this point it's been out twice. It's expensive for us to go through this process, and that's something that the beach committee and Councilman DeLuca is the chair of that committee. He might want to have a comment, but it needs to be discussed at the committee level first before it comes back to council. In the meantime, uh, you know, I've received several phone calls from residents. Where's the ice cream on the beach? And, uh, you know, it's... Uh, you know, it's really part of the experience, the beach experience. And so there, there is a desire for it. Uh, council approved it two years ago, uh, and I would like to really participate in it, but there's a value to it. And I think uh, the council really should think hard about what the value is. Paul, Paul could I ask you a question? Um, you were one of the bidders uh, last year for a, a specific zone. Yes. And what was your bid? My bid at that time was 32000 in that neighborhood. Okay. And that was only for a portion of the beach. Yes. Right? Because it was split zone. into zones. Yes, it was. Right? Yes. And um, how did you do? You lost money. You lost money. Even, even though you were... Uh, I believe bending on the part of the beach that you had not uh, bid for. Well, there were there were times that they had crossed over to that area. Yes. Okay, and you don't think that the minimum bid of forty thousand um, offers you an opportunity to make a profit? A as you know, the process. And, and, and of course, this year, just so that the public is aware, uh, the forty thousand minimum bid is for the entire beach where you can dispense um, not the entire beach. The, I said the entire beach where you are able to dispense. I know there's a portion of the beach that is not included, but all the zones that I believe it was broken down into three zones last year. Mm -hmm. So this bid of 40,000, which is only $8,000 more than your last year's bid, would be for the entire beach. And, and as, a, as a business person, you don't, you don't believe that that uh, Okay. At this late, late stage, absolutely not. Okay. Well, Paul, let me ask you another question. Sure. Have you been dispensing ice cream this year without a permit? Have, to the trucks. No, no, no. On the beach. No. To the trucks. Well, let me tell you that last Saturday, mm -hmm. one of your trucks was parked on Sandy Lane. Mm -hmm. I, I live a couple blocks from Sandy Lane. And I observed one of, assume, your employees coming off the beach with his cart, replenishing his cart. And I immediately called the city manager. I did not know that. Y you're not aware of your employees not, well, vending well, ice cream on the beach without a permit? They're not employees. The truck is not an employee of mine, okay? Okay, well then you should be aware of the fact that there are people with Jack and Jill trucks okay. who are on the beach right. without a permit, okay. um, soliciting and okay. um, selling ice cream. Are you sure they're not ringing the bell? I am positively sure. And I, I know will, the difference. I will look into that. I will look into and that. I have other complaints okay. of the same thing. In fact, I think it was just yesterday one of our, our specials went and mm -hmm. asked them to remove themselves from the beach. Was this the same gentleman? Yeah, it was a Jack and Jill truck, and I think it was over by the, um, the Seagull Hotel. They were down that okay. way I will on check the beach. Into that. Sure. Absolutely. 
Well, only because that doesn't make me feel really good about a, a vendor, you know, who had a permit last year and who chose not to bid right. this year, but yet is vending ice cream. there's two situations here. There's the beach vending and then there's just truck vending. Okay. No, I'm, I'm, familiar, I'm familiar with both. He buys ice cream from me, but he leases the truck for his own business. He's the veteran, okay? There are two trucks in Brigantine, as I, as I know, okay? One buys ice cream from me, the other one does not. Do you know which truck it was? Are you familiar with the um, South End of the Island and specifically yes. Sandy Lane? There's probably a thousand foot of dunes, okay. okay? So he wasn't ringing his bell and he had a cart that he was taking off I of the will, beach to replenish that. the cart. Council, Councilman, I will look into that. If you recall last year, when I did, when I bid 32, I had, there was another party who had bid, the, bid with me, which was not, that person was not a qualified bidder. Did the person also bid on the cove and reneged on the contract. In my case, I, I fulfilled my contract obligations. I paid my fee, okay? I would not have bid 32000 Well, okay. I'm going to ask the solicitor, yeah. I'm going to interrupt for a moment because I don't think we should be talking about a bid that's going out or potentially going out with somebody who, who may be bidding on it, um, you know, in, in an open meeting. And uh, could that influence the way in which the bid is constructed going forward? So, or, or, or I, well, I, I understand, Paul. You, you've been here so. before, and um, all I can say is it'll go through the process, mm -hmm. and something will be put out in the future. I mean, well. it, I, I I understand where Paul's coming from. I mean, is there? I didn't even know there was a bid opening, and nobody nobody won the bid. But um, it, I mean, Fourth of July is a couple it's, weeks away. I mean. Is there anything we we actually had a bid opening and then an auction, and both them we did not receive. Okay. It, you know, so, so that's where we are. We already reduced right. it once. I mean, where can we go from there, Fred? I mean, if, if council's going to talk about whatever the number's going to be, I mean, how quickly can that be done? Or we're just not going to have ice cream on the beach for the summer? That's, that's a possibility. I mean, okay. we have a beach committee meeting on Tuesday, so I think maybe it would behoove council to wait for the beach committee who's been you know, invested in this for the last couple years and was the one that first presented to council to start ice cream vending on the beach. Wait to see what their report is because there has been research done on what the bids are on other communities and, you know, there and, and so forth that would be of interest to council. Yeah. Paul, um, let me ask for a clarification. You yes. mentioned in response to a question from Councilman Palella that last year some of your people I don't recall the exact phrasing you used, but mm -hmm. you acknowledge some of your people may have been outside of the zone for which you had well, been they, awarded if, the contract. If they had, if they had, you know, the, the beach, the, the street signs are unclear, so if they went over the line, it's very possible, and they would come back to the, the proper line. Okay. okay. And what, what are you basing that on? Did you actually observe them going I, a short I have, distance? I've not observed that. Right. So I'm curious because we had gotten reports last right. year that in fact your people were well out of their zone right. and covering almost the entirety of the adjoining zone. I have not received any phone calls from any, any uh, uh, police department or beach committee. Right. So you're so unaware of that happening if in fact that happened? I, this is the first time I've been hearing that. Okay. Okay. okay, well thank you Paul. Okay, any other public comment? Yes, Mrs. Phillips. <clears throat> Ann H. Phillips, 308 27th Street. What is the status of the negotiations on the expired union contracts, and are any new hires being hired under those expired contracts? Defer to the city manager on that. Um, the um, fire union to give us a memorandum of understanding that was signed by the city and the union to reduce the starting salary to 35000 from the original, I believe it was 42000 That's as far as the negotiations with the fire union. Right now, the, our labor attorney, their labor attorney are working on negotiations. Mm -hmm. 
and the new hires in the new fire department, for instance, are they hired under the existing expired contract? They're hired under the existing expired contract, except there is a memorandum of understanding to reduce the starting salary. So they're hired under the lower starting salary. Okay, and the uh, other contracts, police and so on? The, the same thing, the police um, labor attorney and our labor attorney are working together. For proposal, our labor attorney just sent them another notification, you know, asking for mm -hmm. a response back to a counter proposal. So it's moving forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Phillips. Yes, Joan. Joan Reese Evans, 1419 Bayshore. Um, and now I'm uh, going to again talk about the bulkheads for the properties on the bay. And I would I understand that last time uh, we were waiting for a grant and then uh, there was going to be an inspection of all the properties to see whether their bulkheads were either there or not up to par. So I wondered how, what the time frame was for that inspection. I, I don't believe that has started yet, has it? The, the in looking at the uh, various bulkheads? No, not at this point. Well, when is that going to begin and what do we expect? I, you know, I, I don't know at this point when the inspections. I know we've been working with Ed Stinson, the city engineer, and actually Jim Rattel for a grant money. We did get the planning grant in, which can assess some of that. And that through that master plan that the, the grant money's funding, that's where the inspections will be. But I don't know at what point, you know, they're, right now we're just looking at getting consultants to actually do these plans. Okay. And what happens after that? The consultant comes in and they're actually the ones that will assess these different bulkheads and the other, um, the other, the, the other projects that we got through this planning grant, which are in different areas of town. It could be with the master plan and so forth. But the bulkhead's one of them. At the point, um, w there's a di couple different routes we can go to actually get the consultant. We can use planners that we already have initiated as professional services through council, or we can RFP it back out. Once the consultant's hired, they're the ones that actually go out and do these inspections and assess the bulkheads. And I don't know how long it takes them to do that because we don't have one right now. And Joan, the other issue becomes bulkheads on private property that um, the solicitor has already uh, looked at. But um, not knowing at this point, but it's something I know that the consultant is looking at is would there be a source of funding available for for homeowners, maybe low interest type funding or, or something of that nature um, to possibly replace a bulkhead that's uh, either low or re put a bulkhead in that doesn't exist right now. So well, that, that's going to take time. What, what sort of time? Because we're just beginning the hurricane season right now. Well, I now. can guarantee it won't be done during this hurricane season. No, it you know. won't. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I it, it's, it's probably going to take some while. I mean, the, the grant that the mayor mentioned earlier, we just received this grant for the planning. So that's where we were. We first got the money and now we have to figure out the consultant to do the work and I would guess, and I really don't know the time because we don't have a consultant, but it would take a few months for them to do that type of assessment oh, throughout yeah. the mm -hmm. city. And then after that point, like the mayor had mentioned, we need to find how these people can actually fund doing these private bulkheads and it's it's tricky. Like um, we, we had a bulkhead committee and the attorney had mentioned, you know, our liabilities and our um, restrictions are really working on private properties. But we're still working on it. We just don't have any answers yet. Yes. And um, now, how are we going to get around the problem that, uh, the grandfathered problem that uh, people with no bulkheads may be grandfathered? And, and is there some way in which we can um, make people who with no bulkheads responsible for the damage caused to other people's property on the island. That, that's something you can actually do already, but it wouldn't be coming through the city. It would be actually the um, homeowner suing the other homeowner. It wouldn't be something, a lawsuit that would be initiated by the city. But the problem is that the bulkheads that are absent uh, on, on some parts of the island can affect 
um, some properties that are miles away. Mm -hmm. For example, mm -hmm. uh, Roosevelt Boulevard at the bottom where it meets um, Brigantine Avenue, the water had come all the way down from, mm -hmm. the, from the north side, from the bay side, before the ocean had come up to Brigantine mm -hmm. Avenue. So how do all those property owners in between manage? That would, like I said, it's private property. It's not something that the city would get involved with. But you can certainly have a lawsuit from your lawyer and sue that property owner. You know, and probably if you're talking about, you know, I'm not an attorney, how they would, you know, assess it to that property. But that wouldn't go through the city. It would go from one person suing another person outside the scope of the municipality. Yeah, but there's Joan, so re remember that if you're referring to Sandy, that the elevation of the bulkheads, even at the new elevation, um, that during the height of the storm, the, the tidal surge was over the bulkhead. So, I mean, it certainly helps, you know, when you have a, a surge uh, uh, at nine, but it's not gonna help when, when it's over nine. Well, it is because the, the length of time for which the water flows in is a whole lot less if it's just one foot above the nine feet. Well, uh, I, I, it's, it's believe a, me, I was there. It, it's a the water flowed over my bulkhead. It was, um, I'm nine foot, and it came over faster, as fast as possible. Yeah, but it 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 didn't it, slow it down. One bit. It you know yes. It, it slowed down a, wait, a wave a little bit, but it's not going to slow I, down the, the rushing of the water. And, and the, the other, th you know, and we don't want to go into a long discussion, of, and the engineer is not here this morning, but really is about elevation. You know, water is going to go to the lowest point. So depending on the elevation of, of streets and, and homes um, and the surrounding property, that's, that's where you're going to see the flooding. But I don't disagree with you. It's just going to take time. And remember that there are people out there who do not have the resources to spend $50,000 on a bulkhead right now. Well, don't they, you think that that is a responsibility that comes with having a property on the bay? That's a piece of the responsibility towards the whole community. And I, I, I think it's very um, non-community minded, if there is such a word, for, for these people to own a property and not be able to protect themselves as well as all the other people. But, but, Joan, it's also a question whether, where people have been there for years and years and years, and basically they're living their lives out there, and they have no resources to do anything. You know, they may have the, the intent and the will to carry out a responsibility, but they just don't have the wherewithal to do it. Well, if you can't the times have changed so much, and the economy has changed so much for them. Well, don't you think if you can't afford something, you should move? Well, that, that's fine that's in the not, theoretical, but, but emotionally, that doesn't take into, the, into account the emotional and the human element. Objectively speaking, yes, I don't think anybody can argue with it, but put, put a face on it and a name, and it takes a whole different um, you know, point of view you know, or perspective to it. Yeah, but we have to move with the times. You know, we didn't used to have these sorts of storms. Now this is a new phenomenon uh, because they're coming more frequently. And therefore, we have to change our thinking and we have to change whatever it is we can do to well, some extent well, or other. I think we'll continue to, to try and look for a variety of resources that may be available and, and to approach this thing. We have an ordinance in place. If a bulkhead is replaced, it has to be at the new elevation. If a new home is constructed, it has to be at the new elevation. But um, as we discussed before, we just can't mandate that everybody put a bulkhead in at this particular time. Um, but I think if, if there are sources of financing out there for, for individuals, um, I can assure you that uh, Mr. Rotella is looking for it. Thank you. Thank you. And another question. Um, uh, what are we doing about the um, part-time firefighters? Um, have we decided to, to give that up altogether because the five that took the test failed? Well, no, um, actually we have it re-advertised for people to apply for the position again. We're not giving up, you know, it's a shame that the ones that didn't work out, but I'm hopeful that we'll have more applicants because actually I guess after the physical test, I, I, this was on the Don Williams show, um, we started getting a lot of phone calls of people that were interested in the position. So 
Okay. We're going to keep trying. You know, it's, it's a long process, though. Yeah, thank you. And Joe, uh, just so you know, there's not consensus um, among all council members. Um, I, I don't believe that uh, we should be hiring part-time firefighters. That's my own opinion. Um, I believe we budgeted for the full-time firefighters. It's in the budget this year. You already paid for it. Um, and I think we should be hiring uh, those individuals who, by the way, have um, will be hired at a lower starting salary because of memorandum of understanding. So I think we can move forward. In fact, you know, I'd like to throw out an idea since you brought it up. Since we have uh, EMTs who are already certified and, and uh, they are the individuals who passed uh, the fire examiner sitting there on the list um, and in, they're uh, eligible to go to work. You know, we need the staffing right now. And the, the two who have been hired are in the fire academy right now. I would propose that we hire the other three and bring them on as uh, EMTs to supplement the, uh, the fire department uh, staffing right now. They could work during the summer and then go to the academy uh, at the next class where they would become certified as firefighters. But I, I think the staffing need is right now. So my, my feeling is not in support of the uh, part-time firefighters. No, I understand that. But I just wanted, you know, in, in view of the fact that these five had failed, um, what, what the next step was there. Thank you. Thank you. Since you brought it up, I'd like to make a comment. Andy, you had an idea not that long ago. You had a pretty good idea. What was that idea about the uh, salaries and start, the steps? Start them at 30,000 and 20, 20 steps. So at the end of their career, that's when they get paid the most and make the steps long enough. So when you all the people leave at the higher salaries, you have much lower salaries going forward. And that should be something maybe we yeah. push there. I, I yeah. think that's steps. a little bit like what Jennifer just did with the firefighters. The, um, I don't believe that we should be talking about personnel issues and um, negotiations and right. public session. But yes, yes, they're in negotiations right now. And increasing the steps is something that's on the table. Mm -hmm. OK, Mr. Palillo. Place. Uh, I am totally confused. I've heard for months here on this council that the part time applicants were certified EMT and firefighters. Is that correct? Can somebody answer that? One of the um, <coughs> requirements we have is that the people that were applying to the part time, this is the first ad, had to be. Um, EMTs, a number of years experience and been through the fire academy. We did take out the requirement in this last ad for the fire academy, and that's because there was some concern with the union that might, may be discouraged some of the local people that may have not been through the academy. So we're opening it up to a larger pool. So th that's what we're looking at at this time. So, so these part-time people that came in and took the test, were they certified EMTs? Yes, they were certified EMTs. Were they were they firefighters. certified firefighters? firefighters? Yes, they were. Did and they have to take that test to become a certified firefighter previously? The which test? The, the physical test. The that physical they took. test. Yes, at some point they would. Have. Why did they have to take the test again? I'm not um, hiring anybody unless well, they are able. Right. This council should not be discussing the, the performance and qualities of persons who have come to you as applicants. You should not be discussing the employees and their job performance. You should not be discussing former employees and their job performance. You should not be discussing potential employees and their skills or lack thereof. Please do not go in that direction. Well, I'm just trying to clarify something I, here, Fred. Sir, I, I, I understand he made, that. The mayor he, made a statement yeah. that there, these, we should be hiring full-time EMTs. Okay. And as hiring as, these people because they're full-time. Why aren't we hiring okay. the part-timers if they're already certified? If, that if, was my if only council question. chooses to have a discussion about the policy of part-time versus full-time, that is one thing. Right. But let us not That's discuss, what I'm talking about here. But let us not discuss individuals who are in the system. No, at not at all. At a policy level, it's one thing. At an individual level, it is something else. Please avoid those individual We're not talking about anybody in the system here. You are talking about 
a portion of what has been said in the last few minutes is dealing with individuals who were in the system as applicants and their performance. Okay. Let's not go there. So the general question you asked was if someone is a certified firefighter or EMT, do they take the same physical test that is a requirement to be hired by the Brigantine Fire Department? My understanding is no. The test that is developed for the Brigantine Fire Department is a test that's developed for the Brigantine Fire Department. And Atlantic City Fire Department has their test. The uh, Pleasantville Fire Department has their test. That just because you're a certified EMT or a certified firefighter doesn't mean you took that specific test. Is that general enough? But is that fact? That may be what you're saying, but what I want to know is... Well, I can, I can tell you that each fire department has its own test. Mm -hmm. right. And I don't think they're, they're probably similar. I don't know if they're exactly the same, but once you set a standard, that's the standard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the test that we're talking about was the physical test, which I find very important hiring somebody that they're physically <laughs> fit for duty, whether it's full-time or whether it's part-time, for their own safety and the safety of the department and the people that they're so rescuing. To, so to make Fred happy, any future part-time applicant, okay, any future part-time applicant, if, they're, if they are certified EMTs, they meet Phil's test. Well, let's not play with words, okay? Oh, no, let's play with words. No, no, let's I like not, these Bob, words. I said very specifically that we have individuals who are qualified, who have passed the test, who are sitting on a list who could go to work tomorrow as full time with the as with the, with as full -time pensions benefits with the certifications they have i do not believe and i'm very specific about this that we do not we should not hire part time people i think it's wrong so let me be very specific don't. about it. that's not phil's plan phil's plan is hire full time people who have already been qualified and and what i'm saying is hire part time people that have that's already been plan. qualified right, right because it's a lot less expensive, and we as taxpayers will like that. Well, Mr. That, Palolo, there, there are, Mr. Palolo, and, and the public, there, there, are, there are people on uh, council that agree uh, with you uh, that are in favor of hiring uh, part-time individuals. Oh, I've heard it, yeah. And, um, you know, I, I continue to uh, be an advocate for part-time firefighters. Uh, that are qualified, that are certified, and um, I think it benefits the taxpayers uh, in, in a very uh, drastic way, and uh, I will continue to, uh, to pursue that. Yeah. Now, I'm, in, I'm in no way in favor of hiring non-qualified part-timers. If they're qualified, just like the, the full-time applicants are, why don't we go with a cost savings? That, that's my recommendation. Jennifer, I have a general question on the same topic. Which is more of a cost savings to the taxpayers, hiring five full-time or paying the overtime? Um, it's definitely less expensive for us to pay the overtime than it is to hire any full-time employees, even if you just hired, or hired a few. It's less expensive to pay the overtime than hire the five employees. Yeah, absolutely. So in any scenario, if you hired seven firefighters, as opposed to paying the overtime, it's still a cost savings to the taxpayers. It, yeah, it's, it's less expensive for us to pay the additional overtime, which was a little over 300,000, um, than it would be to hire the seven or five full-time people. And then there's still overtime. Last year, there's about 122,000 in overtime. And even though so. two are being trained now as full-time firefighters mm -hmm. and we're paying the overtime, it's still a cost savings to the taxpayers. It, it's a, yeah, it's less expensive to hire two people than seven people, definitely. But it's not all about finances. You know, I mean, if it was just all about money, we would have no staff. Mm -hmm. it, you know, we also, we do need bodies in these departments to do the services. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, how to get, you know, whether it's part-time, full-time, or a mixture, and um, how many we need, you know, as staffing. But it's not all about money. We do, we do need bodies in Right. I just wanted to clear one thing up. The overtime is, as opposed to having fully staffed department, 
it's not costing us more money because that keeps coming up. No, it's, it's actually a lot less money and oh. I've negotiated you know, many years and a lot of times the unions say they don't want more people hired, they rather give more overtime to the people in the bargaining unit because it's a win-win and this, you know, municipality saves. The employees get, you know, more compensation for the year. But, um, but you know, the, there's the flip side. We do need to provide good service. To Thank you. Well, the, the truth of the matter is your taxes are based on what was approved and your tax bill comes based on what was approved in the budget. Okay, not by what you spend, but what has been budgeted, and that's how your tax rate is struck. So we budgeted uh, over $300,000 increase in the fire department for overtime. We also budgeted $225,000 to hire new firefighters. So you, you are paying more and getting less, no matter how you look at it. You're paying more and getting less because that's what your tax base, that's what your taxes are based on. Mr. Papa. Frank Papa, 105 Roosevelt Boulevard North. Can I ask a, a question? Maybe we can, how many actual house fires have we had in the last three years? Do you mean with a with a I fully involved with a fully involved structure? I'm talking about structural fires. Okay, how many have we had? Three. Yeah, but how how many ambulance calls do we have, Frank? Well, no, I, wait a minute. I, mean, I, didn't, get that, Andy, I didn't get that, Andy. I didn't get that. Let me ask the question. It's well, my well, turn. You, no, you asked the question. I'm going. Would you venture to say that 80 percent of the calls that we get are for EMTs? Well, I, I understand. I probably. Probably that, probably a little okay. bit more. Okay, why don't we hire EMTs part-time to run our ambulance? Why do we have to send a fireman out at $40 an hour when we can send an EMT out at $15 an hour? Frank, you're talking about people's lives, first of all. Wait a minute, I'm there's, talking there's, about certified no. EMTs, Andy. I'm not talking about clowns. Okay, that's number one. Number two, I understand that the firemen uh, the part-time fireman failed the physical test. Uh, we're not going to talk about that. Well, yeah, oh, no. I'm sorry. Yeah, we can't okay, talk you that. have to take a test. Do our firemen take a test every year? Physical test? They take a test when they are employed. I asked, do they take a physical test every year? They take a test to get employed. Uh, that's all. They don't have to take Same. it again. For the next 30 years, they don't have to take a, a physical test. Is that correct? That's correct. Right? Yeah, yeah. They, they do not have to take the written test. They don't have to take the physical test or have oral interviews, which are part of the hiring process, except for when they're hired. That doesn't, there's no more physical tests. They do get physical examinations from the doctor, but they do not have to do the obstacle course and everything else that's involved with the physical test. Well, my belief is if you don't have to take a physical test to do the job as a fireman, you take it 30 years ago, if I would have taken it 30 years ago and still been a fireman today with a bad leg, I'd still be a fireman. Well, you, you wouldn't be. Well, why wouldn't I be? Because you have to take a physical examination. They don't take a physical examination every year. I think that's what the manager just said. No, she said they take it. When they, when they get hired. No, no there's, there's a not, difference not a between a exam. test and a physical exam. Yeah, they have to take the test, when, which involves them um, running, hooking up a hose, doing an obstacle course, and it's all time, carrying a body, you know, and, and you know, a simulated body, um, in a certain time frame. What they do get on, I don't, I don't know if it's an annual or, you know, biannual, um, they do get physical exams, and that's the doctor checking them. They're not, not doing the test where they're running through the obstacle course, but they are getting checked by a physician for their fitness and duty. Okay. Yeah, and, and I have to, have to say, Frank, that um, the performance that I have seen over the years and uh, all of the rescues that they performed during Hurricane uh, Superstorm Standy, they obviously had the physical skills to do all that. Phil, I'm not disputing their, their qualifications. 
I'm not disputing the qualifications of the firemen that are EMTs. I'm just saying, give the taxpayers a break. We got certified, qualified EMTs that are part-time. Let's hire them so that the firemen don't have to leave the firehouse and we wouldn't need as many firemen. You, you have to look at the analysis of that because you do need a certain level of staffing with firemen as well. So right now you might find that given a certain number of firemen um, that have to be on duty for the um, requirements that uh, are by code, that they, you're right now you're getting uh, two jobs being done by one person. It's an analysis that would have to be looked at. Well, I think we should make that analysis before you make a statement that we shouldn't hire part-time employees? Well, I've been very clear about that. Well. And, and I'll continue to make that statement. I, I don't think they work in this situation, and um, that's my opinion. And, and, and I'm, not, I'm not dancing around this issue, Frank. I've been very open and very forthright about it. Firefighting is, from what I've been told by the professionals who are involved, they work as a team, especially a small department. They need to know the capabilities of each and every member of that team when they arrive at a scene to take care of that problem. They need to know what that person can do, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are. And I can tell you that I witnessed that firsthand. I saw exactly how they operated in an emergency situation, and that's what they did. They put their strongest people here um, on certain things and other people in other areas. Now, quite frankly, if you have a pool of 15 guys, you don't know who's showing up that day because they're they're on a rotating list of part-time people, and you pull up at a fire scene, and they have three minutes or four minutes, and if you read that front page article, it was in the, in the press about two weeks ago, that is the most crucial time if you're going to save lives and save property. So that's my feeling. I've been very upfront about that. I'm not trying to argue with you. I'm, I, I understand your side of it. I just happen to disagree. Well, the other thing, the other thing. <clears throat> To that everybody that surrounds us except Atlantic City, Ventnor, Ventnor Margate. Margate, okay, Galloway, Absecon, Egg Harbor Township, where our firemen live and have their families and don't feel unsafe, but here in Brigantine we must have full-time paid firemen and EMTs, when all them municipalities have volunteers. And our firemen live there. They must feel it's safe. First of all, not all of our firemen live there. and, and Quite, quite frankly, a few of them. Quite a few of them, Phil. It's, it's all about your perspective and what you're willing to uh, accept in terms of a level of service. Well, I think if you look at, there was also an article in Margate, about Margate, uh, where they talked about um, one of the things that came up were the salaries. And I'm not agreeing with this, um, this comment, but Margate said that we demand a certain level of service. We demand to have um, a, people that, who were interviewed, I don't think they spoke for the entire community, but people who were interviewed, that we want to have this level of service and we're willing to pay for it. Now, that is one perspective. Obviously, you want to have the best level of service you can at the most efficient way of doing that. And um, I think there are some efficiencies that we can achieve, but at the same time, I'm not willing to throw out uh, what I believe is the best level of service that we have right now. I'm not willing to gamble on that to save, to save an undetermined amount of money right now. That's just my opinion, Frank. Well, that, that may be your opinion. I differ. Let me ask you another question, Phil. Sure. You're, you're a director of, of the uh, vocational school. Do you have part-time employees? We have, uh, some, we have some people who work in the evening who teach uh, part-time classes, and some of those people are part-time employees. Didn't we have, have some part-time security officers, too. Didn't you used to have some part-time uh, teachers in the trades? If enrollment um, for that particular class is low, sometimes we only are able to offer a part-time contract, yes. Were they efficient? If, well, they're certified Qualifying? Teacher. Qualified teachers, they were efficient? If it depends on enrollment. Okay. If I have a plumbing class with one plumbing class and that's all I can offer during that day, then we have to hire a part-time teacher, which is not unusual in a number of schools that have any type of program. You might have uh, 
you know, a, a language teacher in an elementary school that's part-time because there aren't that many students taking that, that particular language. So it's not unusual in schools, and it's not unusual in a lot of municipalities, okay? Because well, I don't know if I draw the analogy there, Frank. It's, uh, All right. well, we, we still have the same number of people, the same number of calls, same number of, of um, incidents on the island that the fire department responds to. Um, you're talking about a very specific slice of something that if, if you have 10 students in a class and it's the only class you have that day, no, you don't give somebody a full-time teaching contract, you give them a part-time teaching contract. We use part-timers in, in, in other positions within a town. Yes. Okay. And they, they're efficient. You know, once again, you're, you're drawing an analogy that I don't think Phil, that's... I'm not going to change your mind and you're not going to change right. my mind. I'm thinking about a taxpayer, what we're paying. Right. Okay, right. and if we didn't, if, if we can cut wages, which is 60% of every dollar that we pay in taxes, which is exorbitant, you're not willing to, to, to look at that to do that. Frank, but we are. I, I you know, I'm not going to go into it. I beg to I'm differ with you, Andy. It. I just gave you an analogy how you can do it, and that's, and Andy, that's the way we should be doing it. Andy, that's my opinion. Frank, I've been in business 30 years. Years ago, when right. we used to sit and have coffee in a diner, right? I used to remember hearing Andy Simpson say, "The fire department was spoiled. These fire guys got it made." Uh, uh, now, all of a sudden, you're a councilman, yeah. and you got a different attitude. No, I don't have a different attitude. I okay? just told you how. We've been we were friends for years when you used to sit there and say that. Correct. All right. Now, all of a sudden, you became a councilman. You changed your attitude. No, I didn't. I changed the way of thinking how we could fix the problem. Well, I got news for you. I haven't heard you make a suggestion or the mayor. Hello. Hello. I haven't been hollering about this for the last six months. I'm the one who brings up the overtime. Sorry, Fred. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I want to make a comment about the part-time employees. I know since I've been up here and before I've been up here, the city has reduced staff through attrition. And we've saved a lot of money replacing full-time positions with part-time positions. And I don't see any lower level of service being provided to our citizens. So, I mean, it is working. It's working right here. We're saving hundreds of thousands of dollars a year by replacing full-time with part-time, and it is working. That's all I want to say. I haven't heard any complaints. Well, the, the question was about public safety. Well, I'm just talking in right. general since you're comparing and Mr. Papa was comparing right here in our own municipality. It's working. We've reduced staff through attrition right. and that's the area where we need to cut to save the taxpayers money. So it is working and I haven't heard any complaints from anyone. Do you have any specific examples? CFO. Well, that, that's, that's, that's ludicrous. Yeah, you know, I, I don't agree with that one either, to be honest with you. You're, you're, you reduced a position making maybe $80,000 a year plus benefits and whatever other perks go along with it to a part-time employee. And over the years, that saves a lot of money. It does, but... Um, Jennifer, are we saving money by reducing staff through attrition right now yes. in the municipality? Yes. Is there any ballpark number, a couple no. hundred thousand dollars? I don't have it all in front of me, you know, everything that we did, but if you're just talking about the CFO, I believe the past CFO salary was around 85,000. Our current CFO is 15,000 with no health benefits or um, pension. Mm -hmm. So it's 85, it was 85,000 plus the health benefits plus the pension. So we're saving the difference between them. I do know through economies and efficiencies, this city, we've saved over $600,000. And a big chunk of that is through attrition, reducing staff. One of the issues that we run into is that, yes, we have had attrition in a, in a number of departments, but there's a certain level of service. And, and I, I don't want to speak specifically about the CFO, but um, when you have a, a um, organization that takes in about uh, 50 million dollars a year um, I think you need to um, concentrate on that function very 
very uh, deliberately and make sure that everything is in place going forward. But, but every, everything is in place and things are well, getting done ti in a timely manner. And because well, things I, have been I don't want to speak specifically about that, Joe, but um, I would not completely agree. Not all municipalities have CFOs. Yeah. Uh, our, um, our auditor is perfectly fine with the performance of our part-time CFO also because that question was asked specifically um, to Mike Cicero from Bowman and Company. Right. And uh, based on um, everything that they've done and they audit our budget, uh, he found zero fault. In fact, um, commented on uh, the efficiency and the caliber of work done by our part-time CFO, which is saving us a considerable amount of money. And I hope the taxpayers appreciate the efforts that have been made to reduce full-time staffing with part-time where uh, we're uh, able to. Okay, any, anyone else in the public? Looks Go ahead. Joe? Joseph McGuire, 606 Lafayette Boulevard. I get up here today and start with the comment that I'm tired. I'm tired of good public employees, loyal to their community, constantly getting beat up. Constantly getting beat up, okay? And Ms. McClay sits up there under the protection of an NJEA contract, but a SILES public employees and brigantine. Do you have any part-time teachers in Northfield? I'm sorry. Do you have any part-time teachers in Northfield? Can you start over because I don't know what you're insinuating. I'm asking if you have any part-time teachers yes. in Northfield. You do? Yes. And they teach a classroom day after day after day after day. They come in, they get an assignment, I'm not talking and they about work part-time. No, no, no. I'm not talking about substitutes. No, part-time. Okay. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Certificated, and they work qualified, teachers that I work with, okay. professional S teachers. Excellent. Okay. That's good to know. All right. Second of all, and okay. Wait a minute. You You're saying that who's bashing who? Did I say anything about an employee today? Bashing the public. An and you guys are encouraging it. Okay. I am not, Let's I start not with Mr. Pappas who gets up and doesn't even own a home on the island. Okay. I, he don't rents. make accusations. He does not I own a home. I did not say anything whoa, whoa, whoa. about an employee. Is this my public comment, yes, Chair, yes. or is this Ms. McClay's public comment? Well, you're, you're directing right. something personally towards right. me. Well, I think we, personally. Should, we should try and have a conversation okay. back and forth. All right. Let's talk about a couple things. First of all, 80% of the fire department lives on the island, raises their family on the island, pays taxes on the island. 80% of the department. Okay? So to say that they all live offshore, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Come on. Come on. All right. Second of all, we keep comparing apples to oranges. Ocean City, Margate, Ventnor, Pleasantville, Atlantic City, Brigantine all have full paid fire departments. Okay? We are the smallest of those departments by far. Yet we live on a barrier island where we don't have Margate right next door to come help us where we don't have another community right next door to come help us. And Atlantic City is busy enough, okay? And, and you guys keep bringing up part-timers. You better do a little legal research. Look at the decision that was just made in Cape May about part-timers. Six months, that's it. You can't hire them year-round. They cannot be used to fill full-time positions. And, and again, you know, it's not going to be the first time at least one person on this council has done something illegal, and then, you know, I'm sure they'll try and blame it on somebody else. But that's okay. That's the, that's the status quo that we're trying to sell the public, and it's ridiculous. It really is. When you talk about the physical test, every single paid department has a test to get hired. To get hired. You don't need to pass it to go get out of the fire academy. If they did, three quarters of the volunteer departments wouldn't exist. Okay? Excuse me? Oh, I'm sorry. Here's another one who every single donation she makes to the Democratic Club, she uses her address in Cherry Hill. But she's going to tell you I'm a full-time Brigantine resident. And I'm so Joe. poor that I own three properties. All right? These are people, you're attacking people who are trying to raise families and live a decent life. Okay? Really. That's really. And it's sad that people have to get up here and attack public employees because it makes them feel better. It's really a shame, okay, that people that are protected by a union contract want to say we should hire part-time people, okay? 
there is something about having a right to have health benefits and to have a pension to hold on to and have your family be able to make a decent living. And how about this? How about being able to live and afford to live in the community that you work in? All right? So we want to hire people at $15 an hour and say, you're good enough to treat our sick and our injured, and you're good enough to, to fight our fires, but you're not going to be able to afford to live on the island? You know what? That, that's, really, that's really a little hypocritical. It really is. OK? I'm sorry. I'm speaking, all right? And it, yes, Joe, 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 Joe. OK. Joe, Joe, talk. The union, here's another union guy who's going to tell Joe. us how it is, OK? Joe, excuse me. Excuse me. Let, okay. Mr. Let Mr. McGuire all right. finish. All right. Thank you. All right. That's my entire point up here, all right? Let's show some respect, and let's stop bashing the, the loyal public servants of this city, the police department, the fire department, the public works, the teachers who all do a tremendous job for the residents that live on this island, whether they're here for 12 weeks or whether they're here for 12 months. And we view them, they're not visitors, they're residents of the island. If they're here for the summer, they're residents of the island. They're homeowners. We know that. We respect that. We understand that. But we also know that our guys aren't paying for two homes or three mortgages or four mortgages. We're just trying to raise families and, and do the right thing for our families. And, and again, you guys constantly, constantly are attacking us. And, and, and it's really old and tiresome. It really is. All right? And I really, OK, my time is up. I thank you all. And again, you guys need to do a little more research, Fred, into the whole part-time issue, because there are certainly are laws that govern it. All right? And I know Mr. Bernstein's aware of them. Maybe you need to make council aware of them as well. Thank you. OK. I, I, I want to just say one thing, since Mr. McGuire pulled me into his rant, whatever you want to call his comment. Thank you. Um, I didn't hear anyone here tonight, up here, bash an employee. That is beneath me. I do not do that. I have the utmost respect for every employee of this city. Never once did I say a negative thing, a bad thing about any of you. And that is an accusation that is totally false. I didn't hear one comment up here tonight. And yes, I am an NJEA member. Excuse me. Uh, Joe, uh, How? Joe, 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 please. That is also false. Well, that, we're not having it back wait, and forth. Wait, it's my turn. Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm responding to Mr. McGuire, who pulled me into this. I did not show me evidence. How did I bash an NJEA member in Brigantine? That's absolutely false. Faults, bring it on, because I never did. I supported at the last school board of estimates meeting that yes, we could hire part-time support for the regular teachers. Never, ever bring me the evidence. I respect all teachers. I respect all secretaries and all aides. And I have witnesses that someone in this audience tonight has bashed me at the school, and I have a witness that overheard it. I may okay, have to. Uh, Lisa, you think? Yes. You. All right, Mr. Conti. <coughs> 108 North Roosevelt Boulevard. Answer that, gentlemen. Because your name, sir? Your Jim Conti. Thank you. Answer his question. 36 and a half years, I've been in a union. I have never made $100,000. I don't knock what anybody makes, okay? I bought down a brigantine when the real estate was high, okay? And if you're in a union and you're a union employee, you will find out that seven out of 10 people do not like you because of the money you're making, the benefits, so forth and so on. But if it's that tough and you can't handle it, you know what, maybe you should quit the job in brigantine and go get a job somewhere else. Because I am tired as a taxpayer Coming down here and hear how great everybody is and how tremendous job they do. They get paid. To, that's their job. And if you can't handle a little bit of criticism, well, then go somewhere else and work. That's part of life. 
And it seems like these people, these employees, whether it be policemen, firemen, city workers, people talk about them and they get all upset. You're still getting your paycheck at the end of the week or end of two weeks. I don't know how to get paid. So, I mean, just deal with it. You're getting paid well. There isn't a cop that, that you could probably fire every policeman down here in Brigantine, go to the city of Philadelphia, give them a $10,000 raise, and they'd be happy to work there. And they could still make less than a policeman. Same with the fire department. But I'm not knocking what they make. What I'm saying is if you can't deal with the criticism, well, then just quit and go get a job somewhere else. I mean, I just don't understand why everybody, we're all adults here, they can't handle it. Just like you have an opinion about part-time or full-time, everybody's got an opinion. Just deal with it. I mean, I can understand why everybody's so upset. You know, and we talk about safety, one other thing, if I may. On Roosevelt Boulevard, I can tell you every day that is, if there's a policeman going down Roosevelt Boulevard, we got cops, cars parked the wrong way, we got a boat on the pavement, we got a, a trailer on the pavement, we got nobody doing 25 miles an hour on that street. We've had contractors that couldn't leave. The trash men make comments about how the speed down there. And I have yet to see a policeman get out of a car, stop any, uh, do something about this parking situation or, or for a speeding thing that I've went and made complaints about. Am I knocking the police? No. I mean, I know they got other things to do, to do but I mean, you just got to move on. I mean, people are going to take shots. People are going to ridicule you. Just deal with it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate it. And <clears throat> you know, one of the things that this is a public forum, so obviously there are going to be multiple views of any issue. And you know, what we should strive for is to have a civil debate, so that we can bring out those uh, those differences and and hopefully articulate our rationale for the opinions that we have. Um, but sometimes the, uh, the rhetoric does get heated and, and it does get personal. And I, Jim, one thing I, I respectfully want to disagree with you on is that um, there's a difference between just having a job, and, and I understand what you were saying. You have a job, but there's a, a difference between having a job and people who add value to that job or, or they, they actually go a little bit above and beyond um, on a daily basis to, to, to make a difference in, in the departments that they're in. And I can tell you that a number of our employees do that and there's been, there's been tremendous attrition in departments over the years, the, the police department, um, certainly public works and uh, the fire department has been restructured in a lot of different ways, a lot of rank that doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> And when you have a smaller department, you're asking people to do a lot of different things, wear a lot of different hats, and they, and they do that. So I, I understand what you're saying, but I think what, what at least my comments have been that I, I think the majority of our employees go above and beyond on a daily basis and do a very good job. They could just collect a paycheck, but I don't see that. I see people who really care about what they're doing. And, and I just wanted to make that point. It's, it's a little different perspective on, on having a job. Sure. Excuse me. I understand that, Mayor. I don't want to make it look like, and I'm saying they don't. Going beyond the call of duty, okay, you have to look yourself in the mirror. You're getting paid to do A, B, C, D. Now, if you want to get a little bit of extra, that's on you. And you should, and okay. I believe that, okay? But again, 36 and a half years that I worked for the phone company, okay, and we had guys just punch the clock. Right. And, and I'm sure I, I'm I don't care ahead. what you try to tell me, Mayor, we got people down here working for Brigantine, police, firemen, anything. There are some that just punch the clock because that's, that's just being, that's you being a human being. Right. I'm not saying everybody's giving you 110%. Because right. I'll tell you what, like I just said to you, I told you about Roosevelt Boulevard, okay, I mean, I even, I, and I'll take it a step further, I even seen somebody taking somebody to school in a police uh, car. So, I mean, let's not go, I don't want to say this, I don't want to go there. Right. All I'm trying to say is not everybody's giving you 150%. So let's, not, let's back off where about all the, the Brigantine employees or people coming up here to work for Brigantine. There are some guys that they know, or women, that ain't, are not going the extra yard. Right. And you know that just as well as I do. Hey, That's but, human nature. But, right? but Jim, you know, in, yes, in the businesses I have and everything, when I slap an employee on the back or give them something extra or her extra and their pay because they did something, 
they feel good about that. And, they're, and that's why they're longtime employees with me. You know, uh, if a firefighter rescues somebody, you, yeah, you can sit there and say that was his job or her job or whatever. But they should be recognized and, and our employees should be slapped on the back, just like we slap John, John Doering on the back every time he gets an award and everything like that. So I agree 100%, I mean, Andy. We've we, we got to make people happy to work for us. And yes, I understand that you know, the salaries are up there, and, and I came up with a proposal to bring them down. But it's and fix the problem. Right. You've got to fix the problem. I though. understand that. But you just can't keep on beating on these said guys and, and don't fix the problem. Correct. Fix the problem. It's right. a two-way street. Absolutely. In other, wor in other words, okay, you're making good money. I'm paying you as a taxpayer. Right. So don't rub it in my face. Right. Show but me that you uh, care a little bit. Like I said, like you said about the policeman, we're saying about the policeman. Right. I acknowledge every time I go to Wawa, and I've seen the mayor in Wawa, if I see an officer, morning, how you doing? Afternoon, I hope I never have to deal with them. But I know what kind of job he's doing, he's, so I, I show my respect for right, it. Right. And that's, that's like a pat on the back. But there are people that take advantage of this situation. Yeah. And I they're do, making good I, money, Andy. Yeah, uh, no doubt. I'm not, right? I'm Everybody's not making, no, right? Absolutely. We all absolutely. know that they're making, we're, no we've been talking about, about cutting back on salaries. Yeah. If these employees well, make. fix the problem. The problem I understand that, but I'm saying is they do them. make good money. Right. That's absolutely. why a lot of them, I'll tell you a matter of opinion, aren't no. running. But I, they're I, being abused. They're not running, going somewhere else because in Brigantine, but, you're making good money here. You might not be making it somewhere else. But Jim, me, me, and, a mine, uh, me and a friend of mine, me and a friend of mine were leaving the Pirates Den one day, and a guy was fell off his bike, was laying on the ground. We got out of the truck, and it was he was a retired firefighter, and he turned that guy over, and we started CPR on him. One of the police officers just happened to pull up. At the same time, he had the uh, first time they ever used the zappers, and I think you gave the guy a war. He was dead. The guy was dead. Mm. And his family sat here and cried because they rescued him. So our retired firefighter didn't ask him if he was a part-time guy. Does he live in Brigantine? He, he just pulled him over, and we started CPR on him. We didn't care. And, and, the fire, and the policeman came along, and if he didn't have that box with him, that kid, that, gentleman would probably be dead today. So that's what I mean by slapping somebody on the back. Right. Not right. giving out tickets or whatever the case may be. Oh, I gave out the most tickets. Oh, you're oh doing, no, no. Doing a heck of a job. No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah, you got to keep, you know, you got to keep your employees happy. Hey, Chip, the other thing is every, every organization has a different mission. And public safety, obviously, is to get there as quickly as possible and, and to, to deal with uh, life-threatening events. And um, because of that, there are certain costs that are associated with that. Um, so it, it, you have to look at it in that perspective, you know, that every, every department has, has a, a really a different mission that they're doing. Okay. Thanks, Jim. No, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Sally. Sally Suey, 805 Bobby Jones Road. I can't handle this anymore. I really can't. Jim, I had 21 years at the phone company. I am just now making what I made at the phone company. So I don't want to hear that you're not making what these city people are making. And second of all, that's in the, it's in a contract. The city's going to give it to you. So what are you going to say? No, I don't want that. Of course you're going to contract, con go under contract and you're going to take what they're going to give you. It's not their fault they're making that kind of money. It's not their fault. I'm tired of it. You have people that are working $35,000 a year, okay? That's great money for a young kid nowadays. You retire with benefits, guaranteed you did. My husband just retired in the fire department in December, no benefits. But I know for a fact you could retire with benefits. Right there, that's a big chunk of money that you're saving, isn't it? Right, and you know what? My summer house is my winter house. Well, let me tell you, I wish I could afford to have a summer Sally, house Sally. somewhere. Sally. Thank you. But it's ridiculous now. It's absolutely getting a ridiculous. Did I bash you? No, I didn't. And I know you're talking about me because apparently I'm the only one in here that works for the Board of Ed right now. But why are you? Why? Because to turn, of one of the meetings. Why are you? Are you part time at school? Are you part time? No, would you like to be part time? I get the. So feeling. why would you like all our people to start becoming part time? Thank you. That's it. Because you don't need to answer me.
Okay, any other comments? Mrs. Phillips, yes, Mrs. Phillips. <laughs> Ann H. Phillips, 308 27th Street. <clears throat> I wasn't going to speak again, but I think maybe a few basic things need to be said. Mayor Gunther, you used the term civil debate. Well, I would say that some of the comments made just recently here are not part of a civil debate. You as council and we as taxpayers have a duty, a responsibility to look at the services this government provides and to find the most efficient way of providing them. That is the way we run our government. That's the way it should be. People have, dis have differences of opinion and particularly, uh, unfortunately, it, it's gotten personal this evening. However, it's been personal before and that made it very unpleasant. But when you're dealing in government with the differences of opinion, if those are honest differences and you're dealing in facts, people should respect what you have to say and what you're trying to do. And what I've heard tonight from the last, well, two speakers anyway, I think you've gone over the line in terms of how to handle the differences. The fact that there are differences is good, that they're being expressed is good. When you talk about the contracts, Mrs. Um, Sui's comments about people took the salaries they were given to, that's, that's correct. However, we have come to realize that we can no longer afford those over generous contracts. And I think the people who have, are now expecting to have them continue have to look at reality. And what is there is that people cannot afford those, nor are they necessary. And you have to make adjustments. And you try to keep it on the factual and not on the personal. And to use words like attack and bash are strictly out of their emotional words, incendiary words, but they're not helping to, to clarify the issues or to express them well. They, that should cease. We are in tough economic times. The contracts that we have lived with and paid for over these years, we can no longer afford. And every single worker and employee has to accept that fact. That doesn't mean you don't respect the people, but you do expect them to look at the situation and realize what the reality is. Unfortunately, it's disappointing when you get the response that we've gotten tonight, but I'll <coughs> emphasize, re-emphasize the words civil debate. And we are trying to have a civil discussion because we have problems here. And that means you look at them clearly and factually and you accept what has to be accepted and you try to work together and you don't play games and you don't get nasty and you don't get personal. I, I heard the laugh, but that's an example of what we should not have. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Phillips. And um, I actually, I agree with most of what you said and, and that is, that should be the goal of uh, any of the comments that are made during a council meeting that we should be able to disagree and uh, you should be able to state your case and, and, and the reason why you have an opinion that is based on fact and hopefully uh, based on, on information and data that has been uh, looked at prior to forming that opinion. Um, the, one, the one issue I, I just want to, in my own mind, first of all, I, I can't control what people are going to say. Um, so. You know, once again, uh, we, we want to remind people this is a council meeting, so your comments should be directed toward council. Um, we should not have a, a debate between audience members going on, but along with that, um, you know, we're, when we're talking about um, city business, um, I agree with our solicitor, especially in a smaller community, you have to be careful when you talk about one particular area because you're, it's easily identified the person you're, you're speaking about. So. If we can keep those ideas in mind uh, going forward, I think it would be helpful. Um, and I, I think we could certainly have meetings that have a little less emotion um, in them, in that, you know, we are um, all, I think, trying to achieve the same thing. And that is, and, and I, I would put a little phrase in front of what Mrs. Phillips said, 
we want our services in the most efficient way, but we also want the quality of those services to remain the same, if not better. And uh, that, that's my concern going forward, and, and I've been very upfront about that. I'm not trying to be um, controversial, but I, I'm telling you exactly how I feel. Any other public comment? Yes, John. John Pucci, 100 Sheridan Square. <clears throat> I think there's a distinction when we talk about part-timers. I don't think that they're all in the same category. When we talk about part-timers that sit at a desk in City Hall half the week, I don't think that that's a fair comparison to uh, part-timers that wear bulletproof vests for a living and carry a sidearm and have authority for ar arresting powers and also firefighters that go into a building, a flaming building that nobody else wants to go into to save that child. I've had the, uh, the, the reason the past couple of years since I've been living in Brigantine full time, I've called the police department multiple times. I've called the fire department multiple times. And every time that they showed up, they had the highest uh, professionalism and I didn't I didn't particularly care at that time when they show up at my curb how much they make I, I, I that that they were less of a degree because they're part-timers in my business I hire casual help just so you know in my particular business I hire casual help I pay them fifteen dollars an hour and I buy them lunch every day, and they hold a shovel for me. So in comparison to the responsibility and, and the training level that our police department and our fire department are required to have, the, in my opinion, and I'm a taxpayer in Brigantine too, this is my opinion, $15 an hour is a joke. Are, are we, do we want to hire mama boys? that are still living at home or retired people that have been living that have been in the workforce 35 40 years and they just want a little extra pocket money or are these the 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 the, the people that we want to hire to do the, the the sub these this public safety work jobs in Brigantine every every everybody needs the funds to live in Brigantine to raise a family if there needs to be corrections in the contracts because of the trends from before, so be it. Do, do it during the contract negotiations. But I don't believe, I'm a taxpayer in Brigantine, too, I don't believe that part-time, hiring part-time workers just to save money is, is the answer. My wife is a retired school teacher. 31 years in Galloway Township, NJEA. If it wasn't for her pension, I could not afford to live in Brigantine. If it wasn't for her benefit package, I have certain health issues that wouldn't be able to be taken care of. So in society, in humanity, retirement is important. Health benefits are important to take care of your health. Haven't we always heard oh, health is the most important thing in life? The health of yourself and the health of your family. Well, those costs are needed by employees that we have in Brigantine. And it's not just the easiest thing to say, well, let's hire part-timers so we don't have to pay for all that as taxpayers and let them take care of it themselves. Let them have their kids with sn uh, snuffy noses because they can't afford to go to the doctor or they don't have health benefits. Health benefits are important. Retirement is important. You work that out in contract negotiations, but it's not a fair comparison to say, uh, well, we want the cheapest so we don't have to pay these taxes and hire part-timers. I believe that we should have full-time employees and Brigantine, and I highly support Brigantine's police department and fire department. Thank you. Thank you, John.
Hey, John, I want to thank you for your comments. And, and you know, I think you bring to light an issue that, that I, um, and maybe I haven't articulated this as clearly as I should have. If there's a part-time workload, the example that uh, Mr. Papa was, uh, was trying to get from me, uh, do I hire a part-time teacher? If there's a part-time workload, I don't take the job of two, of one full-time teacher and divide it and make it two part-time teachers. I don't do that, okay? And that, that's, uh, and I agree with what Mr. Pucci is saying. In this instance, what we're doing, or what the majority of council is trying to do, is to take what would be the job of a full-time firefighter EMT and to divide that into two part-time jobs or five part-time jobs. And, and that's where I, I personally have a problem, you know, and for some of the reasons you articulated, but I also have a major problem with the quality of the service that we will get as they have to serve as a part of that team. There's a big difference between having a part-time workload and giving someone a part-time job and having a full-time workload and dividing that workload between two part-time people. Huge difference. Jerry? Jerry Seach, uh, I live at 1201 Ocean Avenue. I'd like to weigh in on the part-time, full-time issue, and I have some different perspective. Um, in my own business, I, I have approximately 350 employees. Most of them are professional healthcare workers. By that I mean RNs, LPNs. Of that 350 people, approximately 150 are part-time. Now I think what the council has been trying to say, and I think we're all in agreement, people have to be qualified. The quality is very important in a life-saving situation. But that if the people are qualified, and I have to stress that, they should be able to do the job as part-time people. I have people, uh, RNs who uh, deal, the bulk of my business deals with pediatrics and with care of people who are very fragile and on medical type ventilators and other medical type equipment. So it's very important that I, as an owner, and I as a human being, have to make sure that they are professionally qualified. Once they are, I use them to do the job on a part-time basis in many instances in the homes and institutions that we serve. So it is not incompatible to have quality and get the job done with part-time people. I just wanted to say that. Right. Jerry, let me ask Thank you a question. You. You're, you're part-time, and, and it's not unusual for healthcare workers, nurses, nurses in particular, um, to work part-time. Where do they work the rest of the time? most of your uh, people? They only work part-time or they work for another agency or? Well, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a different combination. Some of them work for different companies and they work for my company. Sometimes uh, people prefer that they only work part-time. They may want to work three days a week instead of five or six days a week. Uh, it varies. Okay. And that's one of the reasons I asked that is because um, with part-time firefighters and part-time EMTs, um, unless they're working in another agency as a firefighter or an EMT, they are not getting exposed to the training that they would get exposed to if they were a full-time firefighter here. So, I mean, a part-time firefighter EMT, he, he might work at a gas station as a mechanic during the day and, and come work for us in the evening, or they might be in, a, in another occupation. There's a difference between a, a full-time firefighter EMT and a part-time firefighter EMT from the training perspective, training specific with the people they work with every day. And that, that's, you know, one of my concerns, and I've talked about that, you know, going through the process. May I make another comment? Sure. All of our professional people, as a matter of fact, even those that are uh, not professional, require at least a minimum of 40 hours of training a, a, a year in their health profession. So right. they're always, whether they're part-time or full-time, the same requirements exist for all. 
Thank you. I, I would like to make a comment about the part-time firefighters, police officers. It, let's be perfectly clear here that it's not permanent. A part-time position is, doesn't mean they're part-time forever. You can work your way up to full-time. When there's an opening, when people retire, that's a gateway to a full-time position. So, I mean, that's happening all over the place in the private sector and in the public sector. I work with part-time teachers. When a full-time position opens up, they apply, they get preference, and they apply, and most likely they're the ones to fulfill the full-time position. So it's not permanent. It's a gateway to a full-time job. I just wanted to make that clear. <clears throat> it's not like we're gonna have a department, and that's their career, part-time firefighter, or part-time police officer. Well, is there a is there a plan as to how many part-time people are going to replace full-time um, employees over a period of time? I mean, if you had a pool of 100, would you have two full-time employees? I mean, what is the plan? Um, Dr. Kern said there was a plan. I haven't heard it yet. Um, if the plan is to have about 20% of the yeah, staff. Yeah, he's not here. I'm sorry? <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, the plan is to have 20% of the staff part-time, and if those part-time people do all the requirements, like the training, and if they're you know, showing up when they're scheduled and everything else, they will have the first opportunity to move into the full-time slots. But besides 20%, I don't really think our fire department, um, I, I think that would be the cap on the part-time. Well, has anyone looked at how that would work schedule-wise because what do you have 27 firefighters mm -hmm. so we're talking 5.4 well yeah we analyzed it and to replace the the seven people we'd probably need about nine and a half part-time people right but and that's, that's over 20 percent hmm. no we were yeah it's over but that's what we would need in part-time people to maintain the same amount of hours i'm not talking 20 percent of bodies i'm talking about hours so that's what we would need because for each full-time person I believe we need like 2.3 part-time people and you know they would still be required to have the training and so forth that's the plan but you know so far the plans not working because we did have a pool of part-time ones and we were not able to hire them but it doesn't mean I'm not going to keep trying I have the ad out again and I'm hopeful yet again but what we can't get um, the hours that we can't maintain through the part-time I'm going to have to again look at full-time people and like you said there is an academy in October so I'm hoping to get through this part-time process quickly see if you know we can hire some and you know see what kind of full-time people will need to supplement that okay any other public comment I just want to say that just to bring some perspective into what's been going on um, I think the, our role as council, as I see it, let me put it personally, what I think I'm responsible for is to make sure that government operates as frugally as we can in good times and in tough times like we're in now. We're never going to get at a situation where everything is solidified. It may have appeared solidified in the past, but those days I think are over because it's always going to be fluid. And that's why we have to keep discussing it and having a debate. That doesn't mean it has to get personal. If anybody says they can lower your taxes, frankly, I think that's a lie. But what our main job, or I see as my job, is to work toward controlling taxes the best we can. Because one of the things that we keep forgetting here is that a lot of people on this island, a lot, are struggling to stay here. I think we're up to 52% now of our school population takes reduced or free lunches. That has to, that figure has to be in front of our eyes all the time. We have a lot of older people, a lot, who are on fixed incomes. Okay? We're looking at the casino industry that supports a good deal of our permanent residents is tottering, literally and people are afraid. People are hanging on and struggling to pay their taxes, to pay their utilities, to put food in their mouths. We have to be responsible, 
now and in the future to tweak out as much as we can. If we're penny pinching, then we're penny pinching and the dollars will add up. But we have to take a responsible view, listen, and not let it get personal. Except for the fact of look at the people who are suffering and who are struggling on this island just to stay here. Thank you, Joe. Okay, any other public comment? If not, I'm going to close the public portion. Do we need another executive session? No. no? <laughs> For recreational <laughs> reasons? Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, any other uh, council comments? Um, yeah, and, oh. I, I have one. Uh, I just appreciate John Doring being uh, dressed up in a tie and maybe a Where sport jacket next this? time. And, you know, and Fred keeping it professional in a suit and tie over there, you know, on a hot day like today. I, I appreciate that, John. Uh, is there any rumor that Phil's going to renew today? your wedding vows <laughs> after this? So, yeah. thanks. Um, I, I, I would just like to remind the public and our listeners at home that next Saturday, June 28th, 8.30 a.m. is our first farmer's market. So come on out. It's from 8.30 to noon. And come join and see what it's all about. In that same vein, I don't think we meet again before this, so Jennifer, do you want to mention about Family Fun Day or any other events coming up between now and the 16th? Oh, uh, no, I guess it's just, I, I'm trying to think, I think it's just the Family Fun Day. I, I don't have a list of events in front of me that's going on in the community. Is it on our website? Yes. Yeah, our, we put things to the community calendar, and any civic group, I'll mention again, um, pleading with them to please go on our website and post your events so people do go look at our community calendar. So a couple of commercials um, that were handed to me before the meeting. Uh, one is the uh, PBA, um, our local PBA is having a boat cruise um, and that is on Tuesday night, June 24th, which is actually uh, also the middle school graduation, I believe is, is Tuesday night as well. Um, and the bicycle rodeo uh, is the same day as the farmer's market, so I, I'm sure it'll yes. be right in this area. So. Uh, there'll be a lot going on here. And uh, the Brigantine Yacht Club that has been uh, completely rebuilt, um, reconstructed uh, after they sustained uh, major damage during Sandy uh, will have their uh, dedication uh, today at 3.30. And then I believe they're having an open house uh, today and tomorrow. So if you want to stop by and see um, the improvements that they've done uh, to their facility, I, I believe the public is there. Some signs around town you've seen uh, advertising that as well. So. Um, and if the we don't the have any other, yeah. the bikeathon, the bikeathon is the bike uh, rodeo, bike rodeo yeah, for the dispatch. police department, Got and the um, shredding event. That's right, and uh, they'll be shredding at the farmers market as well, right? Bring your papers for shredding next Saturday, right behind the library. Very good. Okay, seeing so no other business before council, any motion to adjourn? So move. All in favor? Aye. 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 Once again, I want to thank everyone who attended the meeting this morning uh, for your participation. And for those of you watching at home, thank you for tuning into your government at work.